Good evening. Everywhere I go on this island, it seems to me I find a generous in. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. <laughs> See, it's a lot scarier when there's no motor sit. We have a bargain. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. Can you feel the pain? Always be young. Movies, take a few notes. His entire work consists of violence, all the time obsessed with the issue of violence. Mayhem, gouging out of eyes, autopsies on the stage. Come. It is time to keep your appointment. Good evening everyone, herzlich Glückwunsch und willkommen zum uh, Doppel Feature Horror Show. Uh, it's the last I'm going to do it today. For some reason I've dropped my uh, title screen, so let's get that back up on. Gosh, what a smooth start. What a fabulously smooth start to the 117th episode of Double Feature Horror Show. I hope you are all well and uh, managed to find this film. It appears that that was... Um, a bit of a stumbling block. Can you believe it? Um, no, no, this film is not widely in circulation. Uh, so I, I, if you had to be creative in getting your hands on it, I forgive you entirely. Uh, it's it's an interesting one. And I, I don't feel that I'd want to handle this on my own. So I, I, I reached out and I got a, I got a special guest for this one, a chap who, who knows his stuff when it comes to psychology. Uh, hello, Josh. Josh Firm, uh, would you care to introduce yourself, sir? Hello, so yes, I'm a, uh, a psychologist, I suppose. I've got a, a master's in psychological research methodology. I actually specialized in decision-making rather than uh, the social psychology that's on display in the film, but I know about that sort of thing. And well, a fair amount about it, not to uh, sort of short, um, undersell myself. Yeah, my background is that I've been working at loadseaters.com for coming up to almost three years now, I think. And mm. yes, I've been doing all sorts of stuff. I've got my own show called Contemplations, where I look at all sorts of various things, be they psychological or not. And um, yeah, I talk lots about politics and news and things like that. So uh, if you're on YouTube and you watch news, you may well have seen me before. I, I think a fair few people here will be familiar with you. Uh, so uh, if hopefully you appreciate uh, Josh being on. It's certainly, it's a bit of a treat for me. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, no, absolute pleasure. It's always a little weird that you, you have to step over those sort of uh, parasocial assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> so, but luckily, um, you know, having chats uh, prior to this has been absolutely fine. And uh, I'm just really pleased that you are happy to talk about the... Um, the Stanford Prison Experiment, because I, I kind of wor worried, would that be a bit too, um, would it be a bit too passe? Is it like uh, excessively trodden ground if you've actually uh, got a master's in psychology? Well, I'm I'm somewhat critical of the, uh, the, the experiment which this film is based on. And the film, of course, being a film, is trying to make itself as entertaining as possible. And so it goes even further than the Stanford Prison Experiment, which I think um, was quite an extreme example of what it was trying to demonstrate in the first place. But I'm not going to get too much into that yet. I feel like I've, I've got to explain what happens in the film first to kind of ground these assertions in some sort of evidence. Yes, I think that'll work well. Um, so before we go further, then, of course, uh, it's not just you and me. Uh, after a few weeks away, I'm very happy to be joined by my regular co-host. And as this has been building up for a while, we'll introduce him in a special way, because down at the bottom of the garden, amongst the birds and the bees, he's making awesome true kind content. It's my co-host, TCG. Oh, wow, what an intro. Thank you very much. And yeah, it's been, it's been a while, isn't it? Been a few weeks. But no, I'm 
excited to be back for this one. Do you know what? I I, I was absolutely gutted though that I missed last week's one, um, mm. the autopsy of Jane Doe. I, I'm actually going to go back and watch that because I thought it was to do with a film that I had seen before. Uh, turns out <laughs> I thought I'd seen it before. Turns out I haven't. And it looks brilliant, so um, I'm going to have a watch of that, and then I'm going to go back and watch the uh, the stream. But hello, chat, and and hello, Josh. Um, I I am not as decorated as you academically. Uh, I am just a guy on the internet who likes to talk rubbish. Um, but I also do the true crime video as well. So, and and very good ones they are. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad you said that about last week's. I was going to say last week's. I think was a really good show. We've actually, I think, Yiz is actually in the chat there. So hey, Yiz. Yiz joined us uh, last week and it was me and her talking about the autopsy of Jane Doe. And I thought it was a really good conversation. We got nice and deep into dissecting that movie. And I think uh, with the changing the title of these streams, we've stopped people thinking that this is just a straight upload of the film, which is driving me mad. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten around it by saying reviewing Das Experiment and not just Das Experiment. People thought this was a whole pirate thing. Uh, drove uh, me mad. But anyway, anyway. We, uh, do, yeah. we do not endorse uh, piracy. We do not condone those who uh, pirate. It's not something that we would ever do. Of course not. Of course not. Um, <laughs> in fact, if, if you if you got a, uh, a legally paid for copy of this film, give us a like. <laughs> That's as smooth as shell I can do around here. Anyway, folks, um, I've got a tiny bit of news before we go further. Um, I will point out that there are links to the uh, content of uh, That Crime Guy and Josh in the description if you want to uh, follow them after this, and hopefully you will. Hopefully you're doing it already. Hope you're doing your bit and subscribe to TCG and also uh, a paid subscriber of LotusEaters.com to help them keep the lights on since YouTube are even less fair to them than they are to me. Fleshy arts. Um, but uh, before we go a bit further, there is a tiny bit of news. I'm not doing a full topic, but there's a tiny bit of news that I thought might be relevant to this channel that you might want to check out before we go further. You may have seen it on the BBC that there was news related to something we've uh, we've been chatting about lately. Our old friends, Amicus Productions. Now, n not not entirely. Uh, coming back, as it were. So in case you haven't followed this, uh, we've been going through the history of horror anthologies really from like the 1920s. We we started way back. We've been doing the evolution uh, one month on, one month off, giving people a break. And we had two months where we were largely focused on uh, Amicus Productions. So that's uh, founded by Americans, uh, Rosenberg and Sabotsky, who came over to Britain, founded the company as a sort of rival to Hammer, doing a, a slightly tamer, uh, more classically minded version of the horror film, mostly in the 70s, uh, but starting in 1965. And we, we had a good time looking at some of those. We were appreciating the Christopher Lee. But, um, they folded in the late 70s, um, but they are back. Not in pog form as Elf was, but uh, they are back. I thought you might like that TCG. <laughs> Niche if, Simpsons if, references. If you, if you get why, well, if you get that joke, then yeah, shows your age. <laughs> oh come on! I led in with a Poddington Peas reference for you this time. I, I don't care about alienating Zoomers. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so this is a quick bit of news. Uh, Amicus Productions, the uh, license to the brand has been retaken uh, by a chap by the name of Laurie Brewster and his partner. I want to say Sarah Daly. I'll get the name right, actually, because they are a uh, company. Where are they? Yeah, Sarah Daly. There we go. Uh, they have been in talks with the Sabotsky family to get a uh, license to use the Amicus brand. And through this, they have been able to relaunch it. Uh, they produced a, their own production label, Hex Horrors, uh, done about 11 films uh, in the low-budget tradition, but now they're hoping to uh, resurrect Amicus's uh, old style. Um, I mean, I like that we have independent British horror production. I'm a big fan of that. I also really like a lot of the energy that Laurie Brewster brings, if you follow him, uh, as I do, and something to uh, particularly excite you is this line here. 
Hang on, Barry, there we go. It's a continuation of the amicus that many people know and love. We don't want to reinvent them for modern audiences. Wait. Oh, it's so hard not to read that in a Scottish voice, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. There we go. There you that, go. Look, look at that. That is, I think, a subtly done way of saying we're going to make good films. We're going to try and stay true to amicus and we are not going to try and chase trends. And uh, there's the uh, man himself, uh, Laurie Brewster there. Um, I th I think it's a good sign. Um, I'm very optimistic about it. They are in in the frozen at the moment. They've they've got a Kickstarter. I'm going to look deeper into it. I'll see if I can chat with the chap. He follows me on Twitter, so I'll see if I can uh, have a chat with him. Um, I fancy throwing a few quid toward them. I'll also note, I should say, this isn't the first time that Amicus came back. Uh, you may remember that like Hammer, after going dormant for about 30 years, they were resurrected in the mid-2000s. From what I can tell, the resurrected Amicus only made one movie. Uh, the resurrected Hammer Horror managed to put out a small handful of them and has then been quiet, uh, sort of, I think, for about 15 years now. No, less than that been quiet for about a decade so i would say that project has probably died mm. but hopefully in the hands of laurie brewster uh, amicus uh, is going to have a longer history in resurrected form and uh, this initial project that they're launching is adapting a few stories from ambrose Bierce and hp lovecraft nice i mean it's interesting they say what they say but we'll we'll, we'll wait and see what they do what they say and what they do might be two different things um yeah we'll, we'll keep an eye on it as yeah i say it uh, i just think it would have been very very easy to say we want a new a new amicus for new britain and they didn't say that it's no. someone who loves our, loves the old style and wants to do the old style so i'm i'm, I'm going to be uncharacteristically optimistic about I mean, given, that. given the fact that you've been chatting about amicus horror films now for a good couple of months <laughs> You should take full credit for this. I think this chap is a is a is a is a is a, is a, uh, is a lurker. He watches your streams and he's gone. Oh, Hamaker's films. Oh yeah, yeah. Gone out oh, yourself in the chat if it's you, or yeah. if you're one of the many wonderful people who turn up and watch on the replay, then you can out yourself subtly, and uh, that'll be a delight. Anyway, uh, that's that's probably about enough from this story. Oh. Uh, a tiny note for optimism as well. The H.P. Lovecraft story that they're adapting is Cool Air, which you'll have last seen adapted with David Warner in the 1994 uh, Lovecraft anthology Necronomicon. Um, it was fun then. It should be fun now. It's also, yeah, it's a weird story. Hopefully the sort of romantic angle goes out because uh, it was somewhat disturbing, but uh, in maybe not in the right way. Anyway, that, that's all from this, but it's a little bit of good news that I'm optimistic about, and uh, I'll try and bring you a bit more on. But with all that said, I think we should probably not click leave studio, which I nearly did. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> no boomerang. No boomerang. Uh, we should probably get right into discussion of Das Experiment uh, with an incredibly boring title page. Look at that. They didn't put the effort in, did they, guys? When when you see a title screen that I, I look at and I think, I can do that, <laughs> you, 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 you know you haven't put a lot of effort into it. Yeah. Oh, dear. Well, it, it wasn't a high-budget film. Um, let's see. I think... Yeah, I think we are, we are good to go straight into it. So um, I can give a, a tiny bit of an overview, just the, the very basics. It's a fairly low-budget production from Germany. It was adapted from Mario Giordano's uh, novel Black Box um, in German uh, by Oliver Hirschspiegel, who you probably know best for Der Untergang or Downfall, which is a tale of the mustache man's final days in the bunker. Um, classic tale of the director did well in independence and slowly got brought up uh, by Hollywood, very much as we saw with our Norwegian uh, director. Uh, I'm going to get his name wrong now. Uh, André Ufredal from uh, last week. Do, do well in your own country. Hollywood will probably come and snap you up. 
uh, yeah, after this Herr Spiegel went on to uh, do Der Untergang and then more mainstream fare. Um, he, one of the things he was offered, weirdly enough, uh, was Blade Trinity. I, I can't exactly imagine the guy who made Downfall making Blade Trinity, but that is a thing that could have happened. Would it have been better? Because uh, I, th I think mm. it's safe to say the Blade Trinity was pro probably the weakest of the three. Would he have made it better? You didn't like it because uh, it did have Hunt at Triple H in it, didn't you? I mean, it, it, it had Triple H. It had Ryan Reynolds as well. I am yeah. a big admirer of him, uh, albeit I'm not a Wrexham fan. Um, <coughs> yeah, he could have bought out the Glazers. Um, Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I have just realised what it was I forgot. And Josh has been far too polite to correct me. <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry, folks. End of a long week. You, you know how this happens. Apologies, Josh. I'm sorry. I like to do this when we have people on for the first time. I like to just little ask them uh, a little bit about uh, their relationship to the horror genre. Um, and I, I'm so sorry. I glazed right past that. Um so that's okay. Let, let's do let's do that before we get into this because I. Well, sure. Um, let's leave. Uh, how do you feel about horror? What's uh, what's your relationship with the genre? Well, I, I tend not to gravitate towards horror films necessarily, but I do really quite enjoy them when I do. It, I, for example, um, one of my favourite horror films, if if you can really call it a horror film, is uh, Kubrick's The Shining, and uh, Kubrick being my favorite director but i'm also very partial to terrible poorly made horror films as a form of comedy i really enjoy bad horror um just so i can laugh at it uh, that's that's one yeah. of my favorite things to do my my wife and i we back in the day we used to love like the old like low budget like crap horror films like my my favorite one was a film called slugs i don't know if you've ever seen that it, it, it's literally uh, it's it's literally a horror movie about killer slugs <laughs> i mean how you get how you get killed by a bunch of slugs is beyond me um but yeah we used to we used to have these um we used to call them we used to call them getting mugged off evenings. So, you know, if we wanted to sit down and watch a cheesy, crap, low-budget horror movie, we'd go on Virgin Media's, uh, like, little um, movie sort of, like, rental thing. And we'd be like, should we get mugged off? Yep. And then we'd go I've, through. I've and done exactly the, the same. Yeah. We, uh, Virgin we, Media as well, yeah. Yeah. And you just basically look, look in, it, effectively, their bargain bin of horror movies <laughs> and then just go, right, let's go for that one. And, yeah, the best oh, one I've yeah. seen to date, just because it's just utterly inconceivably terrible is this film called slugs if you haven't seen it give it a go there's one bit where not to spoil it too much but there's one bit where a guy is on a bed and the slugs are have just somehow managed to appear from out of nowhere and they're all over the floor sort of crawling up the bed but rather than sort of you know just sort of stepping over them or you know stepping on them he just lays there and and, and sc just screams while these things just slowly grow. It's like that Austin Power. It's seen in Austin Powers when that steamroller is going towards that guy, and he's just standing there screaming for about thirty seconds while it's just slowly, slowly getting towards. It. It's literally like that. It's Do you think hilarious. it was worse for that actor who had to just lie there and wait for the slugs to approach, <laughs> or for the those four poor people in City of the Living Dead when they just got sprayed with maggots? Like oh. clearly, just buckets of maggots were being chucked on them. I definitely felt sorry for. Well, I'd, I'd probably say it's worse for those guys. To be fair, they looked so annoyed. Just yeah, I don't blame them. They were I mean, if they were killer slugs, you just cover yourself in salt. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah, like, I mean, it they comes come out of your skin if you sweat. So if you go for a run, you're basically immune. Yeah, they they exactly. could have they, yeah. they literally could have gone Sam and Dean supernatural style and just sort of sorted the the <laughs> like the windows and like the door, like the underneath the doors and things like that sorted. Go, but the, what's okay. a memorable, terrible movie then, Josh? What, what what's a sort of favorite awful horror movie? For some reason. Um, I'm not sure whether they qualify as horror movies necessarily, but the, some of the Wrong Turn films always made me laugh. Oh, I love Wrong Turn. Nice. Elijah nice. Dushku. 
Um, I couldn't believe there were like six of those and then yeah. the remake. It's mm. one of the... How is that still going? I, I was very surprised because it's basically the same film over and over again as well. I, I don't really understand how they can make money from just, oh, all right, we're just going to do another one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's get all of horror, in. Josh. That's yeah, that, that's all of horror. <laughs> yeah, I was to say, how how many Friday the Thirteenth have you seen? If you've seen one, then you uh, bar Jason X, I guess you've seen them all. It's it's very similar to ghost films, isn't it? Where they they're more or less the same premise. Sometimes they even have the same jump scares in the same order. Mm. What, like, what about what about um, par- pa- Paranormal Activity as well? It's another one that's just rinse and repeat. I did enjoy that though, but one of my mm. um, friends did did the thing of telling me, "Oh, it's interlaced with real footage," and then they were, they were trying to like pull my leg, saying, "Oh, yeah, this is all of the camera footage is actually from the real family, and the other stuff is just filling it in." So it made it scarier, Ooh. which I suppose is a good thing. Oh, mate, that <laughs> that definitely would have worked on me. I'm gullible as hell. I get it from my <laughs> mum. What kind of um? What kind of thing would be super effective at spooking you? Then what? What sort of um, thing like really gets you actually scared watching a horror? I think sort of body horror stuff freaks me out because I, I've been exposed to a lot of other things, but um, sometimes something that's really disgusting, particularly if there there are scenes in some horror films where they look in a, a mirror and their face is all contorted and weird and that sort of notion of oh if i were in that position that would genuinely scare me Mm. because it's messing with it's clearly something to do with your perception whereas if there's something scary external going on because i've got that sort of empirical scientific mind i always think well there could be some explanation for that that isn't what maybe they saw I, i like explaining stuff away and if you yeah, that sort of thing is a lot harder to explain away and it's very difficult to escape but uh i recently mm. went to a, a, a real world horror experience when i was on holiday in prague and um brave that was quite something it i didn't expect them to be have people dressed up mm. like touching you in the pitch black and um, <laughs> i got chased around with an actual petrol chainsaw in a, a locked room and there was a, a part where there was a painting where the figures on it were moving and I was captivated by the moving painting thing. Wow, this is cool. I didn't expect it to be this well done. And then a knife came through the painting and a person came through it. No way. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it did genuinely scare me for a second, but um, they, they showed me some photos of um, the, like the, the CCTV, which was night vision. And throughout all of it, I'm just smiling and it actually started to look a bit sinister. Yeah. I, was, I was smiling at all of the, the scary things. It's like that um, somewhat. Um... I'm picturing you like smiling Leo going <laughs> going through in, in like night vision. I, I need to shoot that up. I, I looked more you. like the film smile than anything else. It was almost a bit creepy. I was just like, wow, I need to get a job here or something. <laughs> I remember, um, I, I don't think they do it anymore, but in my local... Uh, local, local shopping center for a few years around halloween they used to do like live like r- real life zombie outbreaks like in 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 real life um where people would do pretty much the same thing where they would all dress up in like zombie outfits and you know and then like essentially it'd be like you've got to get from a to b uh, I, i've never done it because i'm i'm for, for a start zombies are, are my sort of like no go area i hate zombies man with a passion um but i can watch the films and stuff but put me in a situation like that where even if i know that they're fake i am swinging if if i see someone close come um but yeah they they do they do stuff like that as well um again like not not too far um not too far from where i live as well um again i I refuse to go for the same reason so you are a braver man than i am uh, uh josh in that in that in that regard i i would love to do an experience like that but I i just don't have the bottle um, I, I'd rather much just sort of <clears throat> sit down and watch a film, knowing that they can't get me through the screen. I uh, wasn't on my own. I might add, if I were well, on my own, it would have been way scarier. But I was with a couple of friends. One of them was, you know, they had military experience and things like that. So they yeah. were telling, basically, telling me what to do. Right. And, I mean, um, it made I, it far less scary. 
Although, actually saying that, I mean, there, there, there's one that's not necessarily true. I did years and years ago. I went to Blackpool um, and we we did sort of like, you know, like the haunted house things. We did we did something like that. And I like you, I got right towards the very end. We got chased by a guy dressed up as Leatherhead with a chainsaw. And um, it was me and this other this other girl. And we, we darted through like we, we darted past him and like ran out. But what we didn't know is the door that. Um, we exited from which was the final door led out into a pub full of people and so we're, we've come running out screaming oh my god oh my god oh my god and as soon as we burst through the door everyone sort of turned around you know put their pints down looked over and just started laughing uncontrollably at us and we're like oh, <laughs> oh there's a place near me that does these I'm, I'm really tempted now you're selling it you're selling but you, it but you are in the right place because after that you need a drink so it <laughs> We got given beers almost immediately afterwards. They put us in a little room and were decompressed. And I was still expecting jump scares because I'm just mm. like, well, this is perfect. They lock us in a, a small room. Maybe the lights go out. They come back in and they have you cornered in a small room for one last scare, but they didn't. So it was almost scarier when they handed mm. me a beer. And I'm just like, this seems too good to be true. So it, did, it clearly affected my perception of the world in some sense. <laughs> Final scare was the beer was carling, right? Yeah. Hey, oh. don't not call. Me. Hey, call me. Thankfully, it was, uh, thankfully it was a Czech beer, which is great. I mean, can't fault that beer. Oh, I I had Czech Budweiser many many years ago. Mm. <laughs> Did not. Up. Well, it was it was it was Czech as well. So it. it... <laughs> it yeah, it didn't didn't work out. It was actually tr it was actually at a training event. My and I just started at this <laughs> this this job, <laughs> and I, the next day the cruelest hangover. Ooh. Savagery, the free very, beer. Very, very messy. Yeah, very, very messy. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, okay. The, the, uh, in, interesting, interesting. I think you, you get big points around here for for liking The Shining, and uh, I, can, I can also fully, fully respect that some horror is just to laugh at. So, I'm quite nice. difficult to scare. I think is the, the crux of it. So I, I like to, to laugh at, at things, um, but no, there, there have been, I find that sometimes jump scares get me, even though I know they're coming, and it's mm -hmm. a point of shame, really, because I always feel very disappointed in myself for jumping in the first place. It's a, it's a cheap win, it's a very opposite of uh, The Shining, really, but, uh, you know, it's effective sometimes. I think a fair few people will say this film probably barely counts as horror. And it's almost like I was shoehorning it in because I wanted to chat with you about it. But um, I mean, it, it, anyway, it, it sticks with you in a sense. It's like a mm. psychological thriller almost. There's, yeah. there's, there, there is, you could even say it's psychological horror because there are elements of the film which is like, oh, this is quite uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I was quite surprised because when the film opened, it was kind of very, very much early 2000s. Um, and I was thinking, oh, there's, there's this guy walking through an office and he's sort of a wise guy, everyone's saying stuff to him. I, I know how this is going to go. And it actually took me by surprise. With Early 2000s? What, this cool guy? You, are you telling me this cool guy right here who got a zoom in <laughs> shot was early 2000s? <laughs> Am I wrong? Well, uh, look, how can I say... Folks, you know on this channel, I, I have a deep fondness for Germany and the German people, but they have an uneasy relationship with coolness. And Germans <laughs> attempting to be cool. Yeah, that's just not so good. No. Yeah. I think no. it's the sunglasses yeah, and the doors that did it for me. Mm. It's very Matrix. Um, I was going to say, the geezer mm. looks like when he unplugs, he, he, he wakes up in the Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. It's um, there are some very early two thousands aspects to this. Film. I thought the Matrix when this scene came on. As yeah, well. it's. I was just like, oh right, is it that kind of film? And it, I think the soundtrack as well did help that. Perception. Yeah, yeah. German was... techno. What can I say? The, you can't help yourself if you're in German Germany. You've got to put the techno in. It in it was kind of endearing in a, in a way. I was just like, it took me back to time and place. And I, I kind of enjoyed it. And I was almost, although the film was better for moving away from that, I was kind of a bit 
sad i, I was <laughs> I, 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 nostalgia trip well you kind of, you, i did kind of expect a, like a german morpheus to turn up at one point and and say to the geezer nim die rote pille <laughs> my german is terrible but i'm um, guessing that was waifu totenhausen is um it's a it's an idiom for like uh, you'd say that for cringe it's cringe literally okay. means dead trousers um but so yeah <laughs> take take the red pill <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah um so i mean we should probably describe what happens in it um tcg would you like to follow through with the grand tradition of this stream and just give people a recap of what happens in the film um we'll we'll go into specific bits later but just i gather this was a nightmare to get your hands on i really am surprised at how hard it was to yeah. find this yeah i do thank you for your help in helping me find one with uh at least English subtitles that was that was yeah. really appreciated it um but yeah i mean essentially this film as as we've earlier mentioned um is is heavily inspired by uh the stanford prison experiment in which uh, a group of um uh, i would say like psychologists or whatnot wanted to conduct an experiment where they would where they would put random uh people in sort of like a prison situation prison prison guard type situation so um they would <clears throat> i think they recruited people in the newspapers and like you see these people here they've all turned up to uh, essentially like audition for the for, for the project um in, in exchange they would get a uh, few thousand uh, marks uh for participating or there or thereabouts um but they were that so you'd have like half of the people set up as as prison guards and the other half would be set up as prisoners and essentially what would happen is over the next two weeks uh in this uh environment uh, the these people would be watched and observed while the essentially like it was it was people lopped as um prison guards and and prisoners and it it takes a very very interesting turn quite quickly um there are a few rules that the prison guards have to uh ensure um are, are met so that the experiment can continue uh, one of the main rules is to is to ensure that the prisoners uh do not essentially step out of line um and the the methods in which they they take to prevent the uh, prisoners from uh, stepping out of line I say uh, it gets quite extreme um, and then yeah by the end of the film it's I'd say it's just an absolute mess at that point not in a not in a not in a uh, production kind of way but just you know they, they they've been completely de uh, the prisoners have been completely like um, de-individualized um, you know they are they are just numbers. Um, they're they're horrifically abused. Uh, the prison guard, the the people who are assigned as prison guards, really, really uh, become like power, sort of like power hungry. Like they know they've got authority over the prisoners, and 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 essentially they will do things to them that you wouldn't expect to happen in a in a in a ideally in a real life situation. Um, but yeah, it was. It was a very interesting film to watch, and again, as it was heavily inspired on something that actually happened, um, it pulled me in even further. Although, I, I'll, admittedly, I, you know the the events that took place in this film probably weren't as extreme uh, as as the real Stanford Prison Experiment. But I'm sure, Josh, you will know far more about that than than I will. Yeah, it, it's definitely got the movie treatment. Um, Giordano's mm. novel Black Box, you know gives them the black box, uh, the mm. title of black box that is there for um, isolation. And uh, it, there's a certain amount of very obvious films logic brought into it. The fact that we get a foreshadowing of uh, how scary the black box is uh, for our protagonist early on. Um, I'll just get a screenshot of that up. So it's sort of set up and pay off is introduced into this fictionalized version of the account uh also the payoffs have to be bigger because it's a movie it goes into more cinematic territory um but like the stamp i think it's trying to make the same points that were nominally observed in the stanford prison experiment albeit uh, giving it a fair more a sort of interesting context simply because of the time and place of making it but we'll We'll get into it. Um, 
Josh, how how would you do you think this is um how can we say a fair adaptation of the Stanford prison experiment um, without oh. taking too many liberties? <laughs> well, no one uh, I don't want to spoil the film actually, so I won't say that. Oh, but... you can fully spoil it, by the way. Okay. Um, we'll give our spoiler warning, folks. If you've been around here, we spoil this entire movie. We have to to talk about it in depth. So mm -hmm. uh, you you've had that overview. Uh, simulating a prison, everything escalates and escalates, and it gets into crazy town. Everything from here is spoilerville. I think the original Stanford Prison experiment, which was conducted by a social psychologist named Philip Zimbardo, I actually have a, quite a few of his books. I should have mm. brought some of them over to me, but um, just to show them on, on camera. But um, he's kind of been obsessed with the question about why do good people do bad things? That sort of question that has um, followed from the mid-century, um, 20th century that is, mm. and particularly preoccupied um, social psychology which that prison experiment falls under and that's part of the reason why I think he um, recruited, it's quite some time since I studied it, I studied at university and at, at A levels all, all these years ago, so um, I, I believe he studied um, with excuse me, um, his participants were university students. I think they were quite good students. They had full psychological evaluations. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the psychological evaluations in this film were all about <laughs> because they got them doing all these tests and they were like colours and shapes and I've never seen anything like that. I think it was made to look um, a bit um, unknowable in a sense. There's a sort of fear of the unknown going on. That was the impression I got that yeah. there were showing them doing all of these weird tests that seem to have no clear purpose. And I think that that was more of a, a plot device than anything else. But um, mm. the actual um, exaggeration of the Stanford prison experiment is exaggerating an experiment, in my opinion, that is quite an exaggeration of the, how these sorts of impulses that they're trying to understand manifest in real life. I think that there are many replications of the Stanford Prison Experiment, which basically found that as long as there aren't these these bad apples, if you will, or at least that's one explanation, that things run quite smoothly. And there's also the fact that real world prisons, it, it doesn't go to that extent that it does in the film. Mm. You know, we've we've got a very big sample. You can even just look at the US alone a massive prison population and sure there's violence but it's normally into prisoner rather mm -hmm. than guards v prisoner that happens yeah. obviously but i think it was focusing far more on this power dynamic and i think that some of the speculation that this film was trying to understand why people did what they did in the mid 20th century um, might have some weight because had they built upon the Stanford prison experiment in perhaps a way that I might have, it may have shown how the prisoners themselves would have turned against each other, but there wasn't really that dynamic going on. Mm. I think that actually that's, that would be more prevalent than the guards and prisoners. From what I've heard from prison guards, they tend to try and keep a good relationship with the prisoners because it's kind of like, um, with a teacher, in a sense, the teacher that is kind of seen as cool has the easiest job to do because the, the the students respect them, and so that's normally what they go for because that's the, the easiest way to do the job. Mm. Yeah, some some people might not like that because they might think that they're being a bit too pally pally. But at the end of the day, yeah, you're absolutely right. They, you know, these guys have a job to do, and if they can keep them placated, then it creates less problems because like you said you know on on the whole you know when you look at prison populations very widely speaking any sort of like riots or any sort of uh, uprising from uh, from the prison population it happens very very rarely um and like you said in 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 the vast majority of cases it, it does seem to be like quite a uh um, it's almost like a, a balance, isn't there, in terms of like the, the not the power dynamic, but but just the way that you know the, the thing operates. It's like people know their roles, and as, as long as they're respectful to the other side, then 
you know, we'll we'll, we'll do our time, and uh, you you do what you got to do. Mm-hmm. I think one key dynamic of the film is that the rules that the guards are given are quite ambiguous. That, yes, yes, mm. absolutely. And I, you know, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I was going to say because like they they are very very vague, aren't they? They're not they're not clear. You know, whereas if you look at again. In, in a real life situation, there are going to be very clear rules and regulations. It's going to be far more drilled down. These, you know, there'll be certain processes and procedures that guards would have to follow to ensure that, you know, they're treating the inmates fairly and, you know, not, you know, breaching any sort of like human rights violations. Um, not, not that some of the people in there, depending on what they've done, should have them, but, you know, that's beside the point. Yeah, but yeah, the, these guys don't have any of that they're literally just given once like like two or three like one sentence rules and and they have to try and decipher what that what that is uh, what that what that actually means and and what they can do uh within the confines of those rules what were Mm -hmm. the rules actually just out of interest i think one of them was something like you know you have to finish all your food that was one no talking after bedtime address the guards as i'm sorry i was a title mr guard yeah mr Zimbabwe, prison guard that's yeah. it yeah. Uh, yes and the funny thing I, is I, that two of those rules aren't even implemented in real world prisons no so <laughs> weak it, it, prisons weak. yeah peter hitchens would concur uh modern prisons too soft he sort of convinced me there's something that um it, it felt like quite a a key difference to me and also possibly a central problem that I thought I'd raise in this early. So Josh, you talked about the grounding for that um, initial experiment is uh, as a fascination of Zimbardo's. In in this, I kind of insert a different reason with the idea that somehow this research is being sponsored by the army and therefore there is a, a military plant in there to monitor the guy who looks like, well, TCG said straight away, it's Stefan Molyneux. It is Stefan Molyneux. It doesn't yeah, look like 38. he is. <laughs> Where did Susan yeet him to? Here. <laughs> <laughs> poor guy, poor guy. Um, so that was that was an interesting, um, odd little bit of subtext that they put in that I'm not sure why they put it in, but um, we, we could possibly speculate. Um Sure. Um, I, I think it just makes it seem a bit more sinister, really, because, of course, the German post-war relationship with their military was perhaps a bit more suspicious than, than most. And mm. I think to a German audience, I, I don't know what I'm putting words in people's mouths here, but this is just my, my pure speculation here, that it may make it more sinister, like there's there's some sort of military scheme going on and therefore it it puts a sinister tone on on the whole thing but i think I actually it would have been more sinister if it was pure human intrigue in a sense if there was actually a true applied military purpose for it you could um if you were so inclined i don't agree say that the end um you know the ends justify the means and i don't agree with that way of thinking apply to anything but at the same time it could be more excusable and I think that if they really wanted to add weight it, they could have had the experimenter and they, they did have this to some extent where I think it was the the lab assistants delighting in the manifestation of conflict yes and that that dynamic I found really interesting because not only as a, an experimental psychologist where when you see something interesting, you're not thinking about the subjective experience of the subjects. You're thinking about, wow, this this data is really interesting. And mm. although I've not done any controversial experiments, mine have been very easy to clear past an ethics committee, thankfully. <laughs> um, there, there is that impulse in many psychologists, and I quite liked how they represented it and i kind of mm. almost felt a weird camaraderie in a sense of yeah that is interesting i agree you're like um, oh that's gonna look sweet in the write-up <laughs> yeah i mean if you've if you've written up your if you've written up what you think is going to happen uh that's the hypothesis for example <laughs> and uh you know you're, you're thinking yeah there's going to be a bit of a 
a bit of tomfoolery and a, and a little bit of shenanigans going on and then you, yeah you, you know that you see that happening then mm. it, it wouldn't be surprising that you'd be like yes come on i'm you know proving myself i'm proving my theory right here let's mm. let's, let's let's crack on and see how far it goes um do you think that because obviously with the prisoners the you know the, the garments that they wore the fact that they were assigned numbers and were addressed as numbers essentially dehumanized them do, do you think that those watching the experiments would have that, that would have rubbed off on them some somewhat well i think it, it inevitably would uh, the process that they, they went through is known as de-individuation in the yeah. social psychological literature and I think it would have been easier for them to just refer to the num um, the numbers, the experimenters, I mean. And so they would have thought of them in those terms. And also it's quite helpful as a psychologist to be as objective as possible. And so if you assign a name to someone, you might develop a sort of parasocial relationship in watching their behavior and how they deal with situations, which may shape how you observe. And of course, um, you don't want that because that kind of experiment you want to eliminate as much subjectivity on the behalf of the experimenter as possible because mm. you want to see the behavior for what it truly is and um, as a human being you observe other human behavior at a very unconscious level that's how it's processed first and then it comes to the conscious mind and so mm. it's already being filtered through um, all of these different um, Ill impulses and so it's already a difficult job even if you're trying to be as objective as possible and so I think that they would have um, endeavoured to minimise that they would have been very mm. cognizant of that fact and yeah. I think they would have actually deliberately set out to view them in such terms if they were conducting it in real life Can I hop on something here? When you talked about um, the idea of what you want to see as an experimenter um, I want to give a quote from one of the participants, one of the original guards, because um, this the, this came up in uh, John Ronson's book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed. This is not a book I endorse. I would say it's possibly, uh, I would love to see some enterprising young media company dig into it and uh, see how it looks uh, post-2016. I don't think it's a particularly honest book. But I do think it's a very interesting book. And he tracks down, uh, John Ronson tracks down some of the uh, participants in the original uh, Stanford Prison Experiment. And he contends that effectively it's, it's more of a bad apple situation rather than a, uh, the abuse being engendered by the nature of the roles. So he quote, uh, he says that effectively Almost all the abuse came from one guy, a guard, uh, a participant by the name of Dave Eshelman. And uh, he interviews Eshelman, who says that, uh, I'll just read it here. I telephoned him to ask how it felt to personify the evil that lies within all of us. I think I did a pretty damn good acting job, he replied. What do you mean, I said. This was not a simple case of taking an otherwise normal, well-balanced, rational human being, putting him in a bad situation, and suddenly he turns bad, he said. I faked it. Eshelman explained, The first night was boring. Everyone was just sitting around. I thought, someone is spending a lot of money to put this thing on, and they're not getting any results. So I thought I'd get some action going. And um, not reading from that anymore, but effectively the he's going for the idea that, yeah, he was playing into a role. He was trying to meet expectations um, and give them a show, as it were. What do you think of that? Well, I actually agree with John Ronson, which is not something you're going to, to hear very often. But <laughs> I think, yeah, he is right that it's very much down to the individual. And I, I would have put it slightly differently than he did. And I also think that the artificial conditions of a lab experiment Every single person involved knows the sort of ins and outs of the situation, and so it always affects behaviour. Mm. I, I would, if you were trying to observe honest human social behaviour, I would always steer away from the lab. I would look to the real world, and I think that particularly with 
um, these sorts of power dynamics, the, the social psychology more generally, there are so many real world examples that you don't need to run the experiments really. Um, you just need a good eye for what you're looking for and you can analyze it. But I do think that with a lab experiment, and I've, I've had first hand experience of this, that participants want to make the experiment a happy. Mm. And, and there's also the fact that, you know, they're a, a professional, they're an academic, and it's human psychology should be of interest to everyone, or at least uh, it is to most people, I would hope. And there's an element of, well, this person might be interesting to know. It might be good to live up to their expectations. And so people lean into what they think the experimenter wants. And I think that that was certainly going on in the, the Stanford prison experiment. I also think that it's very interesting that lots of people didn't do bad things. There are individuals in the original experiment that were fine and that doesn't get focused on. I think the, the idea that you can be put in a unpleasant situation and become a monster is appealing because it it removes the the notion that there are bad people in the world to a certain extent mm -hmm. but i don't agree with that that people when they do bad things they're perfectly aware of what they're doing it's not like the situation coerces them into doing it they're quite often and um, there's actually a recent study that came out this year that suggested that um, violence male violence in particular isn't an impulsing actually there are neurological signs that it's quite a calculated thing and i think that that's really what's going on that people choose to do these things it's not that the situation encourages it sure there might be some incentives but if mm. you're a principled person you can remain principled yeah in I can agree. difficult times yeah i can agree with that i mean for example just just this evening i nearly lost my um he swore then I, I, I nearly lost my rag no with a guy because he couldn't understand how i wanted my burger king whopper all right um but i chose i chose not to <laughs> and i remain composed and i got my burger all good in the end so are you uh you, you are to play right, a role in a remake of falling down um <laughs> oh my god i would love to that defense guy make it happen <laughs> yes <laughs> Oh gosh! What a film! Let's see that one referenced very often. That's a beauty. Um, I really like that it. film, even though I don't oh. relate to any of the characters mm. in, in the film. It's one of those weird ones where I just enjoy the vibe. Do you know, it's it an is, unpleasant mm, vibe. It is one of my favourite films, Falling Down. Um, is it Michael Douglas? He's yeah. just so good in that film. So good. So good. Somebody gets that rocket launcher. <laughs> just like you know. Imagine just walking around one day and, you know, you just you lose your marbles. Thanks for that I, one, uh, Marina. I did think that was a bit American Psycho. Where, yeah. You know, he, he shoots a police car and blows up that he has this rocket launcher. <laughs> and come on. Oh, oh yeah. So I, so I, I'm amazed, by the way, that Marina actually knows uh, Dr. Zimbardo. Like, yeah. That's quite amazing. I was just enjoying that in oh, the wow. comments. So uh, that's quite a coincidence, Marina. Thank you for that. Um, I suppose there's another thing we should get into that's a bit of a, a heavier topic. Um, I mean, this is so rich, we barely touched the film, to be honest. So, um, but the re there is a certain other purpose to this, um, I think, that you can't avoid. Why was this done in Germany? Um, the, <laughs> the questions the experiment is asking, the fact that it's being done from... Um, uh, Mario Giordano, obviously Italian name, but he, he is a you know a, a German citizen, lives there, raised there, um, and obviously the director is German. Um, and I was look, you know, I I haven't seen this for like twenty years, but you are aware of the subtext, um, which is something that comes up in a lot of sort of post eighties German cinema is that sort of question. Um, which you know, dancing around it no more. It's it's the idea of um, how do you account for the country's previous behaviour in the mid century? What how do you account for it now? How do you make sense of it? 
um, this question of, you know, what, how would I behave if I were in the role of a guard is effectively the question of like, how would I have behaved during the reign of the Mustache Man, during the mid-century? Um, yeah. And the film goes out of its out of its way to bring that subtext in. How fair you think that is, I, I, we can discuss and go into. Um, but, you know, they do go out of the way to even have the rather lovely 82, uh, 82, um, a, oh, actually, I've got the picture of it, address the most sadistic guard and call him a, a, call him a mid-century German uh, uh, yeah. in a fairly climactic moment. Um, I've got that there. Um, I mean, I might as well get it. I, I'll run through them now quickly. There's a, in terms of how fair you think the treatment is, uh, the composition of the guards is notably higher on the uh, blonde hair, blue eye spectrum. Um, I think I've got all the, where, is, where are my guards? Oh, as ever trying to find them. Okay, sorry. Well, here's the guards um, indicating their ascent. Oh yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I was like, Germany, no! Entirely random selection, I'm sure. Entirely random uh, framing. Yes. And uh, I've, I have found it now, the selection of the guards. Just so you can see the composition, it's not 100%, um, but there are notably more sort of classic Nordic looking chaps being selected as guards. And obviously the most sadistic guard is a blonde haired, blue eyed guy who schlicks his hair uh, in a sadistic way. No mustache, mm. though. I, um, Don't worry, Josh. I'm no, not pointing any fingers at you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Uh, I'll th I've thrown that out there. What, what do you think of that? that of that subtext, I, I open that up for conversation. Um, well, I, I didn't really notice the the blonde hair, blue eyed thing, uh, but I certainly got the, the subtext, and I also noticed that they were trying to be subtle about it, but also not quite subtle enough that you might not pick it up like i, I got what they were going for and uh, i also thought it was quite interesting that some of the characters seem to be somewhat self-aware of the parallels as well mm -hmm. i might be reading too much into yeah it, but... i mean I, I i didn't really pick up too much on the composition to be fair because it was quite i mean for, for me the one that stood out the most was the blooming elvis impersonator that was so jarring <laughs> he's a random Go elephant isn't he <laughs> yeah going going from like you know german german german, german I'm, all shook up. I'm like oh my god what the hell where, where did that come from <laughs> <laughs> these random bits of english popping up and i'm like oh my god have, have they have they dubbed it <gasps> no he's just doing elvis again i think the impersonation aspect was actually quite interesting because mm. i thought oh he at first he seemed like oh he's quite a personable guy yeah yeah and you know is he gonna be the sadistic one and then at first he's kind of the butt of jokes a little bit and then he turns bad but mm. then i was thinking about it as the film was going on and i was just like well He's impersonating someone else. That's what he does for a living. Mm. Yeah. Is this some sort of commentary on, well, they're living up to the role they're meant to, to fulfill? He's not actually himself. He's not following who he could be as a person. He's living in someone else's shadow. And I thought that maybe that was some sort of allegory to the, the mid-century Germans. Yeah, well, he's the, definitely an escalator, and his character is, I'd say, the more subtle one. It, I would say he's the best character in the film, if if I may. Um, there are subtle things I only noticed on this time. Like you can get lost in who who's who when there's this many in the cast, but he's sort of the consistent escalator on the guard side. He brings in the fake gun. He brings in the booze. He's the guy who first really disciplines them. And kicks it off. And um, on the rewatch, I noticed something quite interesting. Um, there's a scene, I'll just pull it up here. Um, if you remember the scene where they talk about who's a parent and they, sh they share photos of their kids, the guards do. Do you remember that, guys? Uh, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. Very, Very clearly, yeah. 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 
And we're kind of meant to focus on Beruz there, getting a bit triggered when they uh, ask him why he's not sentimental, why he doesn't have a picture of his daughter. You know, what kind of dad are you? And he's like, ich bin ein guter Vater. You know, straight away, I'm a good dad. Um, and then they, but they ask the Elvis dude and he storms out. Like something really upsets him about the question of whether he has kids or not. Mm. And it's like, that could go a number of ways, but it's immediately after that, he he goes and puts the prisoners in their place, gets them doing the press-ups, gets them kissing his shoe. And then he comes back and gets congratulated. It's like he had to go and dominate them to uh, get his sense of self back. So something about that question of, uh, are you a father, made him feel so inferior that he had to go out and vent his anger. Wie leicht ist er uh, unfruchtbar? Nochmal bitte, one more time. <laughs> oh, uh, wie, leicht, wie leicht ist er unfruchtbar? Oh, I got you. So I, I will translate. Uh, perhaps he is uh, not shaggable. <laughs> um, I'll, I've taken some license in this. Um and later, it's so it's him when he he is the one who attempts to. Uh, we have to do it for uh, YouTube, I'm afraid. He attempts to struggle, snuggle, to force himself does, yeah. upon uh, Yuta, the uh, uh, the uh, female um, scientist. Yeah. Um, he attempts to dominate her. So that me those points put together some quite interesting characterization for him. Uh, possibly he's done that because yeah he was in um maybe he's impotent maybe there are he's very sensitive about not having a partner not having kids and yeah try he when he's uh, he then tries to dominate after being aware of that uh yeah i do you know what it, for, for me that that was a real sort of telling point at that that particular stage in a movie because oh. i mean it showed how sort of removed that even though they were sort of acting within the confines of confinements of the experiment it just kind of showed how like far removed they were from the actual experiment itself because you know they'd actually taken the people uh, effectively hostage at that point haven't they the, the mm. people that were that were as part you know who were who were overseeing the experiment and 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 then to do something like that um it just it, it it just felt like they had really sort of lost who they were who they really were and had completely become consumed by this role that they were meant to fulfill. And, you know, that, that was their identity at that point. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like they, they'd really lost mm. their true sense of themselves. Cause I don't think some, I mean, I could be wrong, but it, it just felt completely the opposite as to what that Elvis guy would have done outside of, you know, the, the, the experiment. I found, um, the, uh, the, Struggle, snuggle. I find that such a, a weirdly euphemistic phrase. Um, I hate having to say it too, to be yeah, honest. Um, um, but I but found Neil that Mohan a bit jarring. Happened. It felt like it came out of nowhere. And yeah. I, I, I didn't really understand it. But I think the point of his character um, and his character arc, if you will, is a commentary on masculinity more generally. It's, you know, he gets shown up by other men and then he goes in and and sorts them out and then he's a pale hero that he proves his sort of physical prowess but then when he gets asked about the family situation and i suppose having a family um is a sort of a, a benchmark of being a, a functional man and he feels like he's not lived up to that expectation and therefore he's less of a man and the sort of implication i got from it was that that's part of the reason why he was so willing to externalize his inner torment in the form of violence and, and tormenting other people, which, um, you know, it is a somewhat compelling notion of human psychology that people do tend to externalize their inner turmoil and mm. take it out on other people. Yeah. And I found that, that aspect of it believable, but particularly them t taking things out on the experimenters, I think that mm -hmm. that would be a line that wouldn't be crossed in a real world psychological experiment. But oh, absolutely at the not. same time, it's a film and, you know, creative license. Yeah. 
yeah, no, I, I completely agree, man. I, I don't think, it, it, for me, it was incredibly jarring because it just, at that point, like how, you know, the whole point of them doing what they were doing was because they thought it was still part of the experiment and they didn't want to jeopardize it um falling mm. apart and losing and, and losing the money that they were that they were promised to get if the experiment had to finish early and then just to go and do something like that um i mean it, it, it didn't make sense because i mean she could have easily i mean obviously she would have reported it um and you know there would have been witnesses that i know he put like a sheet up but you know they would have heard things and they would have, you know, they'd be able to deduce what had happened and there'd have to be other bits of evidence and yada, yada, yada. I mean, it, it, it didn't, it, it didn't sit well with me um, as for, for that particular bit being in, the, in that, in, in that film, in that it didn't really make sense because of the motivations of them doing what they were doing in the first place. Right. Yeah. I, I would go with that. I would say that it, it, it it's a rather extreme and swift escalation. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's not impossible, but the idea of this happens in six days, you know, unless you happen to pick someone who's very, very predisposed to this, um, you're you're not really going to get that turning up. Yeah, I th yeah, I think it. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's something completely out of the question. I mean, there could be a scenario in where in, in which something like this could actually happen, but like you say. You, you, ha I really, th you, you probably have to have people that are predispositioned to it because, like, I think, like you said, Josh, the the people that did the um, real Stanford experiment, um, you know, they had psychological evaluations. I think um, th they specifically looked for people without things like criminal records, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically wanted as, as squeaky clean people as possible, um, and and I think they were like mostly from middle class backgrounds as well. So you know they you know they weren't like me for example they weren't people like me you know from sort of like the lower sort of working class areas um but um i think if you sort of you know looked into some sort of areas where you know you could find people from backgrounds where it, they they could do something like not necessarily the you know the whole struggly snuggly side of it but just you know the the abuse and the and, and and the mistreatment of of other people and they wouldn't have many moral um questions uh asking asked of themselves internally about it i think you could have something similar to this effect mm -hmm. i think there's there's two things to mention here the first is um, they implied that they'd been drinking alcohol yes and they made them really really drunk to the point where they're not thinking about the consequences of what they're doing yeah it might be a little bit more believable but there wasn't that setup maybe they, they subtly implied it but at the same time um, you know it's some acting uh, more drunk could have could have helped sell the scene a bit more although i feel like the film would have been better had they not escalated mm -hmm. things that early on and the second thing is that they very deliberately admit the fact that the guards go home at the end oh, and yeah, of course. go back to the normality of their life so yeah they're not going through the same experience that the prisoners are, are doing they get to go home go back to their families live a normal life which kind of resets them and you, yeah. you hear this from actual prison guards they kind of switch off the moment they're out the door and mm. then they become themselves again and they go back to their family life and it's and i spoke to police officers as well who said similar things that it's just a switch that you know, you, you let your guard down in a, a very literal sense. Um, I, I would say they <laughs> they did actually say it in the film, but they don't make a big deal of it. Um, it it's mentioned once or twice, but it's quite easily missed. I think um, that if they were going for a, a proper and interesting sort of realistic look at the, the human psychology on display, they would show people going home being conflicted or mm. seeing their children and then thinking about what they'd done the day before and then coming in and perhaps behaving better yeah and showing that inner conflict because the transition to becoming immoral monsters i think is way too rapid and the yeah the, the notion that these people would go home to their families go outside and, and be normal and then come back and be evil again if you yeah. added that in, it would ruin the film, I think. 
it would be interesting to really see them come home and like have to discipline their children and just have Imagine. have a little scene where you see how they think about that parenting differently now they've acted as a guard. I think that would be a lovely scene. Or you could flip it and say, right, actually, they you know they bring that role home with them, mm. and the and and the disciplining, you know, the, the mm. disciplining of their children becomes more extreme in line with how they're treating the the guards because they they can't separate themselves because that because that, I mean essentially that that's that's what appears to happen. Uh, they, they can't really sort of separate themselves from from the from the role from the experiment because. You know, no, that like I said earlier, it, it felt like to me that this 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 role as 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 the, as the prison guard consumed them and, and became their sort of primary mm. personality to the point where you know they were even you know rising up against the actual experimenters and you know and and treating them and, as prisoners even like um, dressing was it y- 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 yukte I think I yukte yukte as uh, as one of the prison as one of the prisoners you know they completely mm. di- um, you know through their own authority they had demoted her from sort of above them to below them to you know have that perceived sort of motion um motion of power over her um you know sort of dehumanizing her uh, as well Mm -hmm. um what i was going to ask you josh uh, because again like you'll probably know far more than than i will but with the actual stanford um prison experiment did did the actual prison people who assigned prison guards in that experiment did, did they also have it like a almost like a nine to five role did they get to go home at the end of the day uh, or was that was that side of it documented if they were or did they have to stay like in the confines like all day all night truth be told i i can't remember okay it's, it's one of the, the sort of it should be a key detail so i noticed it while watching this film but when i actually learned about it i wasn't thinking about it in those terms because i was thinking it's like it kind of twigged for me when they were talking about their families and also uh, the uh, one of the guards saying, oh, I need to make a call outside. And it's like, oh, yeah, of course, they've got outside lives. They're mm. coming and going from mm. this yeah. job. But when you actually think about the experiment, uh, it'd probably be worthwhile. Um, someone in the chat maybe might be able to say if they're, they're familiar with it. But I, I'm under the impression that the, the guards may well have stayed under overnight in the original study. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, so I don't I, want I, to uh, yeah, feed you false information. I, I feel like that would have made more sense if they had actually stayed there. I mean, obviously not work 24-7, that would be ridiculous, but, you know, if they had, like, a set period of time where they were the guards and then, out, you know, they then they sort of clocked off, but then there was a place, almost like a Big Brother-esque place, where, that you know, they could be monitored um, away from the families and whatnot, but maybe around each think- other's... So- they may well have done shifts um, where some of them covered the evenings. I, I might be conflating this with another experiment because I've read thousands of psychological papers. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Kind of... Chat ah, with the facts. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Prison... I'm just, I'm Thank just you, the NREAB. Up. Well, I was going to say, the, the prison environment section on Wiki, I mean, again, this is Wikipedia, so take it with a pinch of salt. Um yeah, but it does say the guards were given access. So in contrast, like the guards were to stay in a different environment separate from prisoners. The guards were given access to special areas for rest and relaxation. Uh, as you mentioned, the guards were told to work in teams of three for eight hour shifts. So, yeah, they were working in shifts. Uh, the guards were not required to stay on site after their shift. Okay. So, so it's so, kind of a, a combination of, of both in a sense. Yeah, so, so, they, so they could have stayed on site, which is, and, and maybe like they had facilities there for them or... They could have. That's really interesting, actually. Did they? Mm. Uh, I'll have to look into that. Um, there was something I wanted to raise that's maybe a bit of a swerve about the um, escalation in this, as we talked about the kind of movification of the of the actual experiment for this. I should also know this has been uh, adapted for a movie at least three times. Um, so this got its own remake uh, in an American version. Uh, where weirdly enough, the most sadistic guard is played by Forrest Whitaker. Oh, now that's in 2010, so it's, it's you can kind of see this is clearly pre the current era politics. I know, just like when you had uh, the way uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character is in Die Hard with a Vengeance, or Samuel L. Jackson's character is in Lake Lakeview Terrace. I want to call it. I was like, you you would not have that that actor playing the bigoted character nowadays. Anyway, I digress. Um, there was a, so there was that version in 2010 and then there was the more uh, attempt to be as uh, 
accurate as possible version called Sanford Prison Experiment. Um, I believe with Ezra Miller, and uh, now uh, Ezra, Ezra Miller forced uh, hostage uh, comes up with a very different uh, Google result. So if you can try and investigate it. Moving on. I was going to say something that threw me off that's obviously very different to the original experiment is in this is kind of a major problem with the central character. And I, I want to know if he found this. So he's a journalist and his uh, motivation is he's in there to record it with his uh, wonderful uh, spy glasses. But I, I found it a major problem that he was in from the start agitating and trying to escalate it and be extra rebellious from the very start. Now, is this a a based comment on the subversive and disingenuous nature of journos? Um, or is it a bit of a fault? Because they also built in at the same time that he's naturally uh, defiant because of his upbringing. He's naturally wanting to rebel against authority. And it felt weird that they kind of gave him both motivations when he really just needed the one. How do you feel about that, uh, Josh? Well, I did think about this and I thought that, well, they're, they're trying to paint him as this intelligent character and he's bringing trouble down on himself and the group and yet he still continues with it. So I thought in many ways it undermines my sympathy for him because he's deliberately inviting punishment on his fellow prisoners for his own financial gain to make it as interesting as possible. And so all it does is undermine the emotional impact of the film because I'm just like, well, this guy is not only being incredibly foolish, like I agreed with the, the pilot character, he seemed to be the one who had his head screwed on the whole time. Mm, I know that, well, you know, he's... Well, it was, it was Stefan Molyneux, mate. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he didn't even bring up eggs, I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, I, I thought that their portrayal of him being this sort of educated man who was trying to get a story, you'd also, if you're approaching it as a journalist, you would want to be an impartial observer. You wouldn't be the main mm -hmm. agitator because if you're sharing the video, you're inviting yourself up for criticism and you don't have to be particularly intelligent to know that if you're the one causing all the trouble and the one being punished all the time rather than the other people and you're you know following the rules then it undermines the whole point of doing it surely he should be the one following all of the rules to the letter and watching other people be punished if he's a journalist trying to watch what's going on and i thought that it was a very sort of naive view of how these sort of expose journalist things go down and um i'm not necessarily defending journalists either <laughs> although Good. i would i would technically qualify as one um josh don't no come on man come on i know that's the don't most self-deprecating thing i could possibly say but mm. but still well, okay. uh well let's read this out there because i think to be problematic here highly highly horribly problematic i, th I think there's there's quite a lot of i think boomer thinking about the events of this movie um, I'm just gonna okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a horrible person for about three minutes, folks. So bear it. Just breathe in. I'll I'll be lovely again after this. But I'm gonna be a horrible person for about three minutes. I want to ask, like, when he is openly defiant, openly um, provocative, disruptive, and he is disciplined harshly, you know, this this is one of the major escalations when the guards have to effectively break the rules. And um, you know, take him away and humiliate him and break the break uh, break his will, as it were. I mean, are they wrong? Look, man. I, if you, if you've watched Green Street, then you'll know my opinion on journos. I um, <laughs> I, I see nothing wrong in this scene. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking, like, how many how many Mizzies have we seen? <laughs> who you know would would this help him out? Ultimately, uh, what, I, what I'm basically saying, so let me try and make it fancier. If you read uh, Peter Hitchens' uh, Brief History of Crime, or whatever it's called in the new title, where he talks about the prison system, he says that a major flaw of current uh, prisons is that they assume that all prisoners are the same and respond to the same incentives. Um, and 
oh, everyone's loving it. Jerno gets what he gets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Hitchin says that a lot of current thinking about policing and prisons is influenced by the idea of effectively middle class uh, assumptions. So campaigns supported by people like Bertrand Russell, who went in and were appalled at the conditions, thinking, if I were in prison, this would be awful for me. And assuming everyone would respond the way that he does, that what we need most is uh, good books. Of course, you're going to shank someone. You haven't got a book to read. And Hitchens is very harsh on this quite naive assumption. Now, a lot of people would respond absolutely normally. Um, but in a situation like this, where you have someone utterly uncooperative, utterly disruptive, breaking the rules, making it worse for everyone, whose disruption is likely to spread. Is it realistic that you have to be handcuffed by the exact same rules of politeness and courtesy apply to everyone else? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I did feel a bit bad for him at the same time. I mean, I think that he was unnecessarily being disrupted for self-interested reasons, but I don't think it warranted having his face urinated on. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, 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 in all seriousness, I think um, I, I do agree that they probably went a bit too far when they decided to play yellow shower games with him. Mm. Um, Shaving his head's fair game. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I was down for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's no worse than if he'd ever been in a rugby team, surely. I mean, put put it this way, right? I mean, you you talk about sort of like the same assumptions, blah blah blah. Um, we we went to Buckingham Palace today, and I told you this, I told you this earlier, and uh, you know we had a quintessential British moment where everybody was queuing up uh, in in a system where there wasn't actually a queue system in place, and and staff there had announced and you know made it very clear there is no queuing system. Okay, guys, do what you want, Sp you know, spread out the seats, yada yada yada, and yet everybody, right? in that queue maintain their position including the americans the japanese people the german people that that were that i could you know that i observed and, and and heard in that in that crowd they they knew the standards okay because they were in england and you know people queued up you know whilst uh, evacuating the titanic you know that is how british queuing is okay it is it you know when they when they talk about you know what you know what is english culture show them a queue all right. If 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 one of those people had stepped out of line, right? They'd be told. They'd be told. Okay. And you keep doing it, you'd escalate. Probably wouldn't we on them, but you know, you'd make it very clear that what they're doing is out of order and it's not respected uh, and it's not appreciated. Okay. You need to adhere and and follow. Okay. Mm. I think that he wasn't added, following. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just saying he wasn't following, so he got what he deserved. <laughs> I think if it were real life, um, the press-up punishment of if someone does something wrong, everyone does press-ups, would be really, really effective hmm. at getting people to behave. Because you'd get like a private pile situation from Full Metal Jacket, where if you, if you constantly fail, everyone that... Uh, is meant to be your comrade becomes resentful to you and your life becomes hell and that mm -hmm. you don't even need the authority figures to enforce this that's way say. more effective than yeah than what they did yeah which I was, is only I was gonna, resentment. yeah i was going to say because yeah inevitably what would happen like like you say is that you know the people you know the other prisoners would start to resent him and i think you kind of see that a little bit not necessarily like full-on resentment but you do see it in the film where you know he start acting up and you know these other prison inmates who were sharing the same cell as him are like yeah, shut up shut up stop it stop it stop it yep. you know they they know that you know one of the consequences and again you see it, is they could be punished for his actions as well and they don't want it man they just want to they just want to ride, ride the experiment, uh, you know, relatively sim, uh, you know, relatively uh, with relative ease. Sorry, uh, you know, and get paid. They don't need to act up. You know, what mm -hmm. for them? It's what's the point? And this guy is like not conforming. It's, it's an interesting one. I think you're right, and um, also I think the enforcement on a sort of um, horizontal level where sort of your peers enforce norms is actually the, the older way. It's the pre-liberal way. Hmm. It's it's the result of liberalism 
that you have to go to an official sanctified state justified way of enforcing this stuff whereas it, it's the much older way that things are done less formally um less by the book um but giving you sort of multiple avenues of redress and this is this is more in touch with that i think um i just thought i would i would throw that idea in there just i mean, i'll i'll put the I, I'll put the other side out. Like principally, one of the things he was rebelling against was the lovely Svantaktik being made to drink milk when he appears to be lactose intolerant. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's a fairly legit thing to rebel over. I'm not just being edgy for the for the lulls, as it were. Um, but I'll throw it out there because I think there is a fair amount of boomer truth in here, and the idea that the the guards are instantly being unreasonable and i just think i don't know i don't know the, I, I mean when you have your when only one party has their hands tied then you you're going to get disorder whereas a sort of tit for tat strategy is um i th i think a fair bit more just i do think this is where like the vagueness of the rules comes into play because that rule was they have to eat all their food yada 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 but again it doesn't make any sort of assertions as to whether there would be any exceptions like any dietary requirements that sort of thing so you know it could have been, it could have been possible uh again for the for the guards in that situation where the guy's like sorry i can't drink milk you know I, you know I, I get a dicky tummy uh because of it it would be on you know it wouldn't be unreasonable for them to go right okay we can make an exception for on dietary requirements and then moving forward we'll give you i don't know water you know um but instead they were like no you got to drink it i think the the inner pedant in me got frustrated that they didn't say well that's not food that's a drink actually <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And that, i actually got annoyed i was just like come on i didn't even think of that <laughs> that's such a good point by the yeah, way if, folks, the... if you Folks, if you're just listening, I've got a poll up just to see whether the guards were justified in their um, creative <laughs> punishment. If so this far, is, yes this, is winning. Good. If it's not 100% yes, I'll be extremely disappointed. Let me just check. I don't think you need to be a research methodologist to know that that question 62. is somewhat loaded. <laughs> what what do you mean no 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 trust me i'm a statistician in real life. i love <laughs> i love that <laughs> reminder jano <laughs> just giving context you know context oh, bless. yeah the pedantry is uh is real it, it surprises me like since we know they have access to the researchers that they never asked for a clarification from them like, yeah hey, can i just get it clarified that i have a, a problem here yeah, like, again, I don't think it's unreasonable. And I, and I don't think that the, uh, I mean, again, like, that would have been quite good to see. Like, whether they, mm. in the film, if they'd gone to the experimenters, because, again, we know that they're interacting with them outside of the outside of the, of the prison. If they could have gone, right, look, this, you know, we've got this, this guy here, who, you know, who apparently is as tolerant to milk as the, as, as the Chinese. Um, what can we do, you know? And if they turned around and said, oh, that's fine, don't worry, give him water or something like that, then, you know, it could have undermined what they were looking for. Or they could have turned around and said, deal with it as you please. In which case, they would still have that option then to either do that or <laughs> force it down his throat. I would imagine that in real life, the experimenter would be so concerned with getting sued that they'd be like, no, don't worry. It doesn't matter if yeah, it exactly, infringes yeah. on the quality of our data. So yeah. it's just like, well, this is just a, a little bit too much, really. Mm. I don't know. But then again, I would also think that prior to that, they would have, you know, in, in, a, in a similar sort of environment, especially in this day and age, they would have probably screened for things like dietary requirements and allergies and mm -hmm. all that stuff prior to that. So the meals would have already been catered to them beforehand. So again, uh, this is probably something that was more put in for the uh for the for the entertainment side of it to create that conflict as part Definitely. of the movie hmm. um something we I, I can't think why we haven't mentioned it so far and we'd probably be neglecting the film if we didn't it it takes up a substantial amount of screen time so we probably should uh bring it in um I'll just throw this open to you because this takes up a lot of the film. Um, we have a female character. 
This film is a a proud Bechdel test failure. <laughs> did so, did any did anybody sorry to interrupt on did did anyone get Gillian Anderson vibes? Uh no, I got Phoebe Waller Bridge vibes. Mm. Massively. Um yeah, I, I will ha uh, just want to say quickly, uh, thanks, Ian Reb, for gifting five memberships. Uh, it doesn't show up in Streamlabs side of things, so I, I, I just thought something's going on when uh, I noticed noticed an interesting flurry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very, very much appreciated. And uh, congrats to everyone who's managed to pick up a membership courtesy of the Ian Reb. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, that she, she also gives me kind of like very 90s David Lynch character vibes as well. Like, uh, is it Audrey from Twin Peaks? Um, I got that immediately. Oh, yeah. Josh, I didn't ask you. Where are you on the David Lynch question? Uh, what's the question? Do I like him or not? Yes. Oh, yeah, he's great. Uh oh, Harry oh, and thank you goodness. now. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, me, me well and done. Harry have many a conversation about David Lynch. As we... Harry, my colleague at Lotus Eaters. Yeah. Uh, one, one, I'm one happy of our, to hear it. We have to screen, you know. What, one of the what, one of our previous, um, what used to be regular, Harry and Gladive, who used to be on the podcast um, quite regularly back in the day. We 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 sat him down and we watched uh, Mulholland Drive, and he hated it. And now now he hates David Lynch as a result, just because yeah. of that film. <laughs> Very <laughs> triggered by David Lynch. <laughs> Twin Peaks is so good. How could how could someone do that? Yeah, Mulholland Drive is genuinely in my top ten. But I, recently, I think, I think since I covered Lost Highway with um, with Harry, I think Lost Highway now kind of like tips it and just gets slightly ahead. I uh, just oh, we 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 shouldn't lynch post too much because it's. Um... <laughs> By the way, I know someone suggested we we do have a space at the end of this month. I will get the uh, the. Um, the poll out for what uh, our final psychological horror should be. I know someone did post Inland Empire. I'm, I'm going to have to say no to that because I know it's Lynch and I know it will need multiple watches and studying. So I can't give a quick take on a Lynch film, but uh, hopefully we'll get around to it. Um, I, I thought I'd raise her here just because she takes up a lot of screen time. And I just wondered what you thought of the uh, role of the, I haven't even remembered her name. I'm terrible. Um, what's her name? Why can't I remember? I just call her German girl. German girl, there we go. Oh, is that terrible? It's it's no. it's it's Dora. Accurate. Dora is her name. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I kind of felt she was a huge time waste. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. I actually found it kind of annoying, actually, how she broke into his apartment and then just made herself at home. And she <laughs> yeah, yeah, and visited him I mean, and said, like, I'm living with you now. And you, you you, slept with him after you knocked into his car. I'm sorry, yeah. but if someone knocked into my taxi cab, you don't see him You don't see him calling up the taxi company saying, hey, I've got damaged taxi cab. This is terrible. Oh, my, you know, what am I going to do? He's just kind of like, oh, well. At least I've got a woman in my house now. It's like, yeah. that, no one thinks like that unless they're a weird creep. So it made me lose sympathy for him again, other than being a journalist, being an agitator. And he's a bit of a creep. And he's meant to be the main guy who you're kind of rooting for. I'm pretty sure it's there's like, a no. <laughs> spot of advice like, for him. Yeah, and also her, her father had died. She'd just been to his funeral. And then she's like, this seems perfectly moral to do. It's like, oh, come on. Could, could we know. maybe could, being very prudish? No, nah, no. Nah. Could we call her Dora uh, the Deutsche Entdeckerin? Uh, the, the explorer, <laughs> <laughs> the German explorer. Uh, she's been explored a fair amount, I imagine. I just I found it very weird that you got sections like I've got this one saved as why. Yeah, she was pointless. What, what, like lots of <laughs> oh, Jesus. This is funny. She's wearing clothes. It's the She's only thing I... I can get away with this. It's to just... be fair, it was the most memorable moment in, in the movie for me. Couldn't I tell kind you of... why. Go... Could not I tell mean... you why. Go on. Oh, no, no. Not... no. I, I mean, this is... Um, I kind of felt this was more of... This is like... The shots of her are because Tarek is thinking of her. He's like trying to mentally get himself out of the scenario. And he's been cooped up and he's a bit um, thirsty. 
<laughs> and that's why he's imagining her like this. But the man's dehydrated. <laughs> what are you talking then, about? Then the sh- then the film is also telling us no, she is actually in his apartment, so it's not a projection. And I just I found it very weird and distracting in that. Uh, do you know what I mean when I say it's like a a typical European film sort of way to just try and just just art it up a little bit, just make it a little <laughs> more artsy. And I One... felt that's what she's there for. One charitable interpretation I came up with during watching the film, because I kind of came to this realization midway through, is mm. that he, uh, Tariq is his name, or what? Uh, yes. His name. Um, he's having an invasion of his privacy on both fronts, <laughs> both in the, the private and, you know, first hand. Mm. And it's kind of exaggerating all the different ways in which people can come into your life and kind of mess with it in a sense she's like reading his post um mm. you know sleeping in his bed if someone did that you know even if you know it's, it's my girlfriend came in unannounced and poking around my flat i'd be like what on earth are you doing yeah. at least mm. at least ask you know it's common courtesy i wouldn't feel comfortable with someone after they did that and it's just kind of accepted just like yeah i just moved in fine and he's just like okay not taken aback at all yeah, I mean that—that that would be the most shocking thing in the film. Not even you know the guards killing something. I'd be like, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> you met me yeah. once. You, after yeah. your, your father died, you crashed into me, stayed around my house. And now you're living with me. It... I'm, I'm sorry, but what? Better I mean, be she, drinking my milk. She is largely there, just I think, as an interesting parallel, but kind of half thought out. Like the fact that she doesn't know where she's going. Uh, she's her, her father's died, so she just doesn't know what to do. And Tariq has like abandoned his path as well because he faced a scary situation and he just noped out of it. And that's why he's been a taxi driver, sort of avoiding his life. And then Hmm. they have this collision and then it sets them both on the path. And for for me, it's a little bit, the parallel is there, but it's a little bit weak. And I felt they mostly you wanted her in just for symbolism at the very end. I'll, I'll get the end shot up because I thought they obviously thought about it quite a lot. I will say that. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I was really proud of that comment I put on there. I'm just going to say that last yeah. image. If <laughs> you're not enjoying chat, you, you, you always keep an eye on chat. It's always yeah. worth it. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that last image you showed, not the one in the night vision, but that last one. We know. We know oh. which one. Uh, Chats votes are in. Uh, yeah, uh, guards one hundred percent justified. Just FYI. Okay. All, all, that, um, all that. All that image needed was a ping pong ball. Scandalous, scandalous. Yeah. So I, I think she's in there for um, symbolism, like what I got from this this ending shot, because this is a European movie, so it needs to be just like that little bit artsier than anything else. You know, this is. It's it's not massively subtle, but at the end of this experience, they're there, man and a woman, one in black, one in white. Uh, you've got this idea of duality there. So they, we've had a we've had a situation where the experiment puts them into a duality. Are you a guard or a prisoner? How do you turn out? This idea that within each of us we could go either way, which is I think what the film wants to say. But then before of them is this wide open sea. So that's like the idea of wide open experience that you can go forward as someone with that duality in you. So even though you've got that duality, it is sort of your choice which way to go. What do you reckon of that uh, sort of A level, uh, <laughs> level, uh, sorry, A level paragraph? Of a statement. <laughs> See, th- this is why I appreciate this channel because I just saw this scene and saw it as two people sitting on a beach. Well, oh, you thought it was going to go like Kevin and Perry I... go large, and he was just going <laughs> to make some sandcastles. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Look, look what I can do, Dora. <laughs> look at my sandcastle; it is great, yeah. It's all niche references today, isn't it? Poddington <laughs> peas and Kevin and Perry go large. Crikey! Um, at least got the latter one. Hey. But, um, um, yeah, I didn't get much out of this scene, if I'm being honest. I thought that there was an intention of some meaning behind it, but it was just two people staring at the sea. Um, I, I got the sort of duality of it, but I wanted there to be a bit more exploration of the emotions, but it was so emotionless that 
it almost seemed anticlimactic to me. It, mm. I was a little bit disappointed. I, I wanted him to talk about the emotional impact of the experience or how mm. he finds it difficult to get close to her or something like that, because they're both separate. You know, mm. if it's a couple sat on the beach on their own, you think, you know, they'd be leaning on each other, arm over arm, that sort of classic thing of, oh, it's got a happy ending. Yeah. But they just kind of sat there staring and it kind of just was such a neutral ending, I think, that I found it, it, it could have gone either way and been a bit more in, interesting. Really. I did get the sort of duality thing, but that's about, um, in, in terms of the filmmakers, that's about as superficial as a, an analogy as you could possibly come up with to end the film on. And I feel like <laughs> there's such um, deep human emotion it being tackled here that there were so many different interesting things that you could end on and I don't know it it seemed like it was just a whole lot of nothing I kind of was expecting there to be something that I maybe missed I even rewound the scene to see if I'd missed a detail or something that and I don't the, know. The, the the news report as well at the end um I swear was inconsistent um, unless unless I miss something altogether, because it, it, it mentions in the news report that there were two dead and three injured. Mm. Um, I, I counted three dead. Because you had uh, Tvail Nagtig, he was gone. Yeah. Uh, you had Professor Torn, who was shot in the face and seemingly died. And then you also had that prison guard who was brained in with the fire extinguisher. I, I think Professor Torn just lost an eye. Oh, okay. Oh, so he was just in, okay. So he was just injured. Oh, he was one of the three. I but yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I would, I'm not. We are not bound to say this film is the most amazing thing ever. I, I think it's very interesting. But yeah, the end for me is where it falls apart. Um, it feels slightly overlong, and I, I think, I wonder if you guys felt this when it it moved completely unnecessarily out of the prison setting. And then everyone is lost in like back alleys and let, let me, I, I have got one for this. Hang on, here we go. They're kind of just lost in uh, undergrounds and the wilderness and uh, just what looks like, um, I don't know, the underside of the facility. Mm. And at that point, it's sort of, how is anyone finding each other? I've got no idea where anyone is. Um, so I, this really lost the tension for me. And it was also just like too long. People running around with no one knowing where they are. I'm what, not what, sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go that was to say, what really didn't help for me personally in this scene was that the, the video that we were what, that I watched of this with the English dub, I mean, I can only assume it must have been some sort of copyright issue. But yes. they, they, they threw on some really, really over-the-top like rock music, which <laughs> <laughs> just... Did not set the no. did not fit did not match the scene. I noticed it was, that it as was, well. It was yeah. very sad. Yes, I, mean, and, I watched and, in the German. So yeah, I, there, I there was, there was quite, yeah there was quite a lot of dialogue that was missed out from the subtitles as well because I could I could tell that these were um, like custom subtitles that someone had gone through the trouble to. To, to to make them and match them up because obviously at the beginning and the end they were like oh you know please like and subscribe uh, great shilling by the way lads and ladies um, but yeah at that, that particular point with the massive sort of I mean I could I could have I could I could have handled it if like you know muted it and the sub subbies were still working but I, I kind of didn't know what was going on and then you had this like massive and I I thought that I had something else playing in the background like my, <laughs> my, my like my phone was like going belly up and it was playing two things at once. It took me a while to realise it was the people who uploaded this. And just, yeah. I was like, what on earth? Absolutely drove sure. me mad. Um, <laughs> because I had the um, original German with English subtitles, and there was some pretty jarring music in the background of my version as well. That was right. a jaunty German tune, wasn't it? It may well have been. It, yeah. it, it seemed a little bit silly in my view. Um, but I did um, enjoy the scene when they're out. At, sorry, do come. I was just going to say, I think they were doing the Clockwork Orange thing of we'll give you the jaunty ditty, the the lovely soft tune, and then show you horrific violence. But I think it it doesn't work as well in here. Um, although when they played the Beach Boys, I thought that was quite effective the first time. I, um, I just really liked the, the song. So yeah. I was <laughs> I was just tapping my foot along, just like, oh, this is all right. Yeah, It kind of took me out of the film because, you know, 
late sixties music is some of my favorites. So mm. I was a bit distracted by it, but the scene when they're all running around the sort of outside of the prison, I mm. quite enjoyed. And I'm not, I'm not sure whether this is just my sort of inner rebelliousness coming up because mm. I, I kind of have always enjoyed going to places where I'm not supposed to be, um, not outing myself now, but, mm. um, Josh with I the urbex, who knew? <laughs> but um, I, I always find it interesting. And the fact that they're running in places where they're not supposed to be, I thought was a bit of a, an analogy to the fact that they're exploring human emotions and behaviours that they're not supposed to. And mm. It was meant to reinforce that notion that they're in a place where they don't belong. And particularly people running around um, in robes in like what looks like almost like a car park or a, a generator room or something like that. It's a jarring juxtaposition. And so I think it was emphasizing that point to a certain extent as well. Yeah, I could see that. I could uh, I could go for that one. Maybe I'm trying to be charitable. I try and read into films so I can enjoy them as much as I can because I'm, although I, I can be easily amused, but um, it, I find that if you try and give a film as much as possible on your end, you will get more out of it as well. Hmm. Well, we, we are fans of the, of the deep interpretation. Yeah, I can, I can see it. The breakdown of boundaries. I can see that symbolism. Uh, yeah, you make a good case there. Like For me, I lost track of everything. Um, but I, I think you've got a good case there. I'll, I'll just pause and say uh, thank you again, the NREAB, dropping more memberships. You're an absolute star. As I said, it doesn't show up in um, StreamYards, but I uh, just noticed. So um, thank you ever so much. And uh, everyone who just got a membership, just uh, dro drop a little note of appreciation for the NREAB. And, and another uh, five. Blimey, next. Oh, my goodness. We haven't even got that many people in the stream, my, my dude. <laughs> Hopefully they pick it up. Um, it, if you're dropping this many, uh, you're going to have just request request another film okay request another film i i i definitely owe you a film for that and also the last one was good i like uh, mr gb uh, requesting plan nine from outer space never again uh, <laughs> oh still not recovered god <laughs> that film i love that you did the homework and then we had a big gap for it and then mm -hmm. it was like, oh, we need to rewatch you. You're just like, I can't do it. No, I can't. No, I couldn't. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so this sort of issue with going out uh, among the outside, I thought was interesting, but um, obviously a little disputed. I felt we really got back on strong ground when they went back in the kitchen um, for the finale, mostly because this landed... This just landed an image that really sat with me. And I say, I watched this first when I was studying, uh, you know, as an 18 year old. And the image of uh, Tarek catching the knife in his hand absolutely had, had not left me. And I immediately thought of it. Uh, YouTube's not going to like this one. And folks, if you're squeamish, it's not too bad. I mean, if you're on this channel, you can probably handle it, but I'll just get this up. This is a bit of a, a raw image. It's not too grisly itself, but it is, I found, effective. We, um, we should we should throw in a disclaimer here. YouTube, this is not a real knife. This is not a real injury. It's yes. a scene from a movie. It's, it's corn syrup. It's the same stuff <laughs> that they use for pig's blood and carry. Yes. There's a throwback. There you go. How do you find this bit, TCG, with uh, Stefan Moll and you breaking out the Kung Fu and uh, <laughs> owning um, a bunch of guards with a baton? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can't make an omelette without cracking a few eggs. But um, Yeah, this was a Chad move. I loved it. It was quite a payoff, wasn't it? And yeah. I found it, it... Is it a little too filmy? Maybe. I Maybe. found it a very satisfying thing to see, and I thought he shot it really well. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I liked it. I liked it. Because you kind of think, oh, my God, he stabbed him, and then it's like you look down, and he's like, oh, my God, he caught the knife with the blade. Oh. And then it's like when he pulls it out, like when he, like, and he sort of like struggles to like pull the knife out of his... Oh, mm. loved it. Loved it. 
he grabs the knife with the blade and stabs you with the freaking handle. <laughs> right, TCG? Yes. He's going to get executed because he's a loony. <laughs> Good old Eminem. Yeah. Um, sorry. We ca- on Ongoing thing, Josh. Ongoing, Josh. Um, sorry. Ongoing thing. How, how did this work for you, this section? I was actually pleasantly surprised because I thought it was setting up for him to get killed. Mm. And I was just like, oh, of course, you know, the love interest comes in only to, to watch him die. And it's going to be really sad. But I'm not really going to care because it was such a silly ending. But he, the fact he caught it, I was just like, oh, OK. And then rather than retaliating, they're just kind of shocked. It's like a moment of, oh, wow, they can break out of the spell. I thought that was actually quite good. I was pleasantly surprised. Actually, you just reminded me. Do you know what I thought was going to happen, right? I thought the girlfriend was going to kill uh, Zibun or Zibtig. Mm. And because when she goes into the prison, right, and she starts, like, going around and she's trying to look for um, uh, for Tarek, you know, she, come, she comes across the, 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 the prison guard who's been brained in by the, uh, by the prisoner. Mm. Uh, and then there's the gun. Um and then obviously she grabs the gun. She, I thought, you know, she's seen like, oh my god, the, the prisoners must be out of control. And so, you know, she grabs the gun. She goes to the kitchen area where this is happening. And of course, she sees um, Stefan Molyneux and uh, and Tarek just going to town on these prisoners. And I thought she was going to shoot Tarek to try and uh, thinking that she would be saving the prison guards from the prisoners in a, in a sort of cruel twist of cruel twist of fate uh but that didn't happen so but i would have loved that if it happened like oh my god you were not the bad guy oh my god i'm so sorry i'm so sorry Tarek. I'll, uh, can i still live in your house can i still drink your milk hmm? <laughs> I, I don't i think i would have been a bit frustrated with that ending i'm just like oh for goodness sake a, a twist <laughs> in the very annoyed as well yeah very I mean, annoyed would, i mean it would have been dumb it, i mean it would have been <laughs> dumb but I, I was genuinely expecting it at that moment like oh my god she's <laughs> gonna kill him <laughs> i also liked how um stefan molyneux wasn't a complete badass fighting sorry i used a bad word but um oh but... josh oh we we we, we can i, I don't like see it as a swear really it's uh huh. in britain it holds far less weight um but <laughs> I found that him actually getting hit from being attacked from three sides was quite realistic. Like he knew yeah. what he was doing. Mm. He could take maybe one guy quite convincingly, but then just the sheer weight of numbers kind of took him down. And I think that was quite well done in that the temptation would be that, you know, he's this uh, good fighter. I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and um, he, would would be able to take all three of them out. That would have annoyed me because that's not very realistic. And I think mm. that they, they dealt with that very well. And then that scene kind of resolved itself where they, they were kind of on the ground, things had simmered out. And then all of your attention turns to Tarek and the knife situation. And I think that it closes off all of the sort of plot lines for you to be completely focused on this end point, which is quite good really and it kind of mm. accentuated um, what could have perhaps fallen flat had they not otherwise absolutely no wholesome chicken wrangler we are not covering that not a chance <laughs> sorry sorry josh you were saying i was sitting there yeah it's i was, I was pretty much done. no that's cool that's cool it I think it resolves things well um, and a bit more creatively. And no one, no one wants super kung fu Molyneux to just own everything. It, it couldn't work even on a story level. It couldn't work because Berus and Tarek have to have the confrontation. In fact, even the researchers say it themselves. They deliberately selected uh, Berus and Tarek to be in their roles so that this confrontation could happen. That's Which is actually, also... oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, please. I was just going to say that, that specifically selecting particular participants wouldn't really happen in a real psychological experiment. Mm. You you look for, as long as they meet the criteria, then randomness is actually desirable. If you deliberately engineer a situation 
it really reduces the quality of your data and, and other psychologists will say well you've created the situation so it's not reflective of the real world particularly if it's a lab-based experiment like this one well everyone would just dismiss it as well you've deliberately engineered the situation there's not really much you can translate to the outside world which i mean coincidentally is some you know what happened in the real deal to a certain extent in the mm. actual Zimbardo's prison experiment is that it was a product of how they had selected the participants and who they had selected. Mm. Um, were there any sort of like notable changes in subsequent attempts to redo the experiment um, that you know of? Any like where they have sort of altered the population that they had in there? Um, most you know. of the time, the experiment didn't really work in the same way as Zimbardo um, illustrated. Most of the time, people kind of followed the rules and it's a bit boring, which I think is part of the reason why that doesn't get nearly as much attention. It's far more interesting to say that if you're put in a situation that's adverse, that you become a monster because that's exciting in a, in a sense. Whereas, mm. you know, bad people in bad situations do bad things is so common sense that it doesn't really um, give you any sort of emotional payoff to, to come up with that mm. realization yeah the really um, interesting question i suppose is like you want to you want to know how would it have been if tarak had been a guard and baruz had been a prisoner that's a sort of um I mean, I don't know how that would sit with this film, really, given what I think they wanted to maybe insinuate about Beruz. I think Tarek would have been even worse as a god uh, because he would have been able to go back to his little journo desk, sit in front of his little journo typewriter <laughs> and then type up an absolute hit piece, slating the experimenters for letting him go as far as he did. Completely absolving himself of any it. responsibility, saying, I did not want to do these things, but the experimenters would not stop me. So I waterboarded several prisoners. I peed and pooped on several others. I even murdered four. In fairness, he, he had this random tramp turn up in his house. Come on. <laughs> yeah. He was he was very stressed at the time. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't paying the rent. Yeah. And I was just following orders. <laughs> But, well, um, you know, that is that is some of that subtext that is mm. in here. But I think despite despite some, um, <laughs> I think, shady imagery, I think it's fair to say this this isn't the kind of... I, I point out a lot that, especially in films of the 70s and 60s, you see a preponderance of blonde-haired, blue-eyed villains where you might not necessarily expect them to be uh, peeping Tom, would be a good example where the chap even has a German accent, even though he's meant to be a Londoner. Oh, and yeah. Village of the Damned, also from 1960, would be the other example where these sinister aliens are all blonde-haired, blue-eyed and collectivist. Hmm. In this, though, I actually don't think they're doing that trope. No, I don't I think, think so it's either. here to quite fairly and reasonably raise a question that has a particular cultural context in uh, this situation. So actually being quite fair here yeah and and the fact that it was based on something that actually happened mm. you know there, there, there's like you said that like, like we've said before you know there is a there is certainly creative sort of freedom that you can that you can exert from 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 a story like this um i mean you, you see it all the time i mean mm. in especially you know, in like true true crime sort of circles and you know mm. the, sort of the horror movies that have come out in that, that have been sort of loosely linked to um, real life events, you know, and, and how they've been sort of warped and, and for want of a better word, dramatized mm. uh, to, to almost like sort of separate themselves and exaggerate them, uh, exaggerate from, 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 from what actually took place. Uh, I mean, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a mm. prime example of that. Um you know, because that that was that was loosely based off the story of uh, Ed. Okay, guys Ed in the chat, Ed Gein or Ed Gain, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, but you know, <laughs> that regardless, I mean, I mean that, that's what that's what got my channel started in the first place. Um, 
was that was that was that particular story and then obviously yeah as as time's gone on there's other films and stuff like that i mean screen is loosely based on real life events and mm. we're talking from a from a from a spooky night that kevin sullivan had and and <laughs> um thinking that a particular serial killer was going to get into his own but uh but yeah, with, with this, you know, there there were quite, you know, I wouldn't say shocking, but you know, there were quite controversial moments in the real Stanford experiment, just from what I've what I've been looking up um, over the course of the stream, and you can sort of see how they could have escalated and sort of dramatised and exaggerated elements, and and thought, yeah, this would make a good film if we if we add this bit or if we change this bit here and make it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think that's a fair assessment. They, you know. For what they had to do, I think they made some quite interesting choices. My main complaint is that Tarek should not be escalating as a journalist. Um, I that's my main I mean, problem. I mean, uh, I'd, I'd sort of look at his role as someone like. I mean, and we're all familiar with Big Brother here, aren't we? The TV mm-hmm. the reality show. It just reminds me of someone who sort of goes into that game show with a uh, goes into that you know with with, with a game plan as such. Um, you know, so, someone who goes into like the Big Brother house and just intentionally just stirs things up to create drama, you know, to create, um, you, you know, just a generally bad atmosphere just to try and make themselves look better. Uh, you know, try. I, I remember Victor from, I think it was like Series 3, he was a prime example of that. Terry first... goes in like, I'm not here to make friends. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> you know, or you could say Andrew Tate, for example, because he was oh, in there, wasn't he? Um, but no, I mean... Actually, I was going to say that to you, Josh. I mean, would 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 an experiment like? Because I mean, you could, I suppose, you could look at Big Brother as kind of like an experiment in a way. Um, would you say that something like that show would be more uh, would be would be more reliable in terms of trying to get the sort of outcomes that you were that, that you're getting in 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 events like the Stanford experiment? Um, I think that actually it's probably less likely because everyone who participates in an an experiment is cognizant of whose eyes are on them. I mean, it's a a very deeply seated human intuition. Who's actually watching you? And if the entire public has the potential of watching you, well, you're going to be very calculating in how you portray yourself. I think that actually a lot of these reality shows, the drama is engineered Mm. behind the scenes or they deliberately do it and it's calculated. And actually, if it were done for real without, you know, the public watching in and the people didn't realise they were actually being filmed, it'd probably be incredibly boring and no one would watch it. Well, Um, yeah, I think that that, that's true. Um... I mean, it certainly would like the later series of Big Brother, uh, for as an example. I mean, you've got a whole host of other reality shows you could point out, but I mean, th- nowadays they they tend to be more manufactured and engineered and sort of steered in a particular direction. But if you look at things like I think it was like the first or se- the first few seasons of Big Brother in particular, um, I don't think there was an element of engineering in those particular seasons i think it was very because it was very much at, at, at that time and it was you know just still relatively early internet days but at that time you literally could go on to like a big brother website and you could watch these people 24 hours a day um so there was no i would say there was no opportunity for for people to sort of you no know, Oh, yeah. Tw- twist this person's arm and or you know say this thing to get this sort of reaction and you know let, let's because you know we want we want a good sort of highlight reel for for the for the, for the 10 o'clock show um it was very much i mean in latest nowadays you don't get that you, you what, what you see is what uh, channel four or whoever's present you know whoever um produces the show now if it's still on um present to you but back then especially the first couple of years you you could see everything watch everything um but yeah i mean I, I, I yeah i suppose i suppose you are right in that you know if everybody's watching you you're, you're more conscious and that sort of lends more to the uh situation in this film towards the end where the guards take over the you know essentially <laughs> take over the asylum if you will you know it, it doesn't seem reasonable that they would do that if they knew that they had you know 
Again, they knew why they were there. They knew what the incentive was for, was for completing the task. They the actions that they carried out on that on that mm. on that day were in response to trying to maintain the the task from 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 continuing to to proceed. And and yet they get, they just go really over the top to the point where that like there's no there would be no justifiable defence for it continuing. It does strain believability, but there's an aspect to it that I kind of like. Which is this sort of a subtext of there's gonna be kind of a maverick take, but the theme of elites being affected by the imposition of their programs in a way they don't intend. Like this idea of you have a rational thing that you put into place and it's like, oh no, in an organic environment. <laughs> it's got a little out of hand, guys. Like, mm. which I think is really good against that idea of the planned society and the rule by experts. I think it's amazing that those plans meet real flesh and blood people and it all goes to pot. How I saw a nod there, Josh, is that? Um... I did get some weird sort of satisfaction that the experiment has got a bit of comeuppance as well. Obviously, you know, mm. the, 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 the throwing the, the lady into the prison cell and what happens afterwards, I, I didn't get any satisfaction out of that, mm. but just the, the notion that they're getting a sort of taste of their own medicine of what they've imposed on, on people. Um, because I think when, when you are a research psychologist, you are very cognizant of the experience of what you're putting your participants through. And most of the time, my experiments, I was just putting them through excessive boredom. And, uh, you know, I felt a little bit guilty, to be honest. But also I was thinking, well, think of all the good data so having looked at it from a sort of inside perspective, if you will, kind of reveled in the notion of, well, clearly you should have stopped this experiment ages ago. You're kind of getting your just desserts in a sense. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, I, I enjoyed the chaos of it, I suppose, even though I thought that it wasn't very believable. I think what I enjoy and what I think actually reflects the real world can be two separate things. Mm. So I thought the film was actually surprisingly good i i enjoyed it more than i thought i would and um it, it was quite emotionally impactful in some senses as well in the, its sort of portrayal of, of violence and things like that and i'm oh, sorry i would say i'm glad to hear that i i, I obviously you know haven't haven't spoken about the kind of films you like so i, I had no idea how you would take this one so that, that's that's nice to hear well, I mean, I've watched a pretty broad variety of films, perhaps not as much as, say, my colleague Harry, who really outdoes me. But, you know, I'm not, not too far off. No, no. Not, not in the least. What I figured this is an odd one, but it'll, it's an interesting one. I had, I had some faith, but I just I didn't know how it would land exactly. And I'm overall quite happy with the, the response to it, to be honest. Um, but, you know, with that said, that that is us over the two hour mark. Um, is, was there anything else in particular that uh, either of you wanted to cover that we didn't get to? Um, um, I suppose I could just talk very briefly about the, the psychological aspects that the film was trying to interrogate. Please, please yes. Um, I think that in a lot of situations, people, if they were put in this scenario, as the film would uh, kind of pose it, would just look for an easy life for the two weeks. They wouldn't be causing trouble. The guards would perhaps be a bit more understanding and less sadistic, particularly because they're being observed, but also that they're going home and being restored to their normal life. And also they're aware of the consequences of their actions and that the other people in the prison could just as well be them had the, the luck of the draw been different. And so there are lots of factors that would, that would change the situation. And I think that um, overall, that a lot of emphasis has been placed on the, the psychological revelations of Zimbardo. And actually, I find it more interesting that people resist the, the temptations of doing bad things in a situation mm. than are tempted by them, because there's they're clearly more interesting psychological subjects because they're not bent to the whim of their circumstances. There's clearly more going on in their conscious mind. If they're just reacting to stimuli 
from their environment well you know it's it's not really the conscious mind acting which is the the more interesting part of the brain because they're basically reacting in the way an animal might mm. just responding to external stimuli um, and not really thinking things through um, and that's in the milgram experiments quite a lot isn't it that they're they're reported as this thing where human beings are surprisingly willing to commit horrors if told and mm -hmm. The actual experiments, if I recall this properly, show that actually they resist a heck of a lot, especially if you tell them they must obey. That really yeah, well, sets, a, sets us in um, opposition. Mm -hmm. I think a lot gets focused on the fact that some people were willing to go up to a lethal dose, but then they were constantly being reassured by an experimenter that they should carry on. And it's perhaps that they just don't realise the actual consequences to the full extent. That's just as believable as, you know, they're willing to conform and kill someone as long as someone else takes the blame. Mm. I don't. I think that that's there are multiple different ways to read the the situation. The tendency is to say, okay, this this thing happened and that happened because of this. But human psychology is a lot more complicated than that. I mean, mm. I like to trot this phrase out to, because it makes me sound um, <laughs> far more esteemed. But the human mind is the most complicated thing in the known universe. So if you think you understand it, you probably don't. <laughs> and that you need to have a lot of humility in approaching your explanations. And sure, it's presented representation. There are some sort of compelling, unbelievable elements to it, but it's mostly fictitious. But it's an entertaining fiction, and I very much enjoyed it. I didn't find the fact that I knew the underlying psychology it didn't remove my enjoyment of the film. In fact, if anything, it kind mm. of accentuated it. Um, but I think it's always worth to bear in mind that real people don't behave nearly as sadistically as this. And maybe I'm just some sort of hopeless optimist, but people are faced with adverse situations all the time. And you know, nine times out of 10, they behave morally. And I think that it's quite a cynical view of human nature to suggest that if you're put in the right circumstances, otherwise good people become bad. Well, it's actually that bad people can mask how bad they are and often do. I mean, you look mm -hmm. at, say, clinical psychopaths, they, they find themselves in the top positions in businesses. They can be top surgeons. They, you know, they, they achieve quite good careers to mask their, mm. their inner yeah. There was, so, there was one who got well, to was it vice president at uh, Pierce and Pierce, I think. Um, I mean, I haven't heard that specific example, but I can certainly I, believe it. I mean, I would, I would, I would just sort of say in, oh, in wait, defense. Is that, in, is that American Psycho? Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got there though, didn't I? <laughs> you did. I mean, I, I I would say in defense of psychopaths, um, that not every psychopath. Hold on. <laughs> hang on. No, no, hear me out. But but it is. But you know. But not every psychopath would necessarily, therefore, you know, do bad things because you know they they lack the emotion. I mean, they. Of course. There are there are psychopaths out there who you know are clinical psychopaths who do not have the ability to you know understand the emotions or or, or, or you know or, all that stuff that yeah. comes with it, but yet still will will still have a, a moral compass in like okay, I don't give a monkey's if I was to do something like this to somebody, but I choose not to because from from a from an you know from a self preservation stance you know it would it wouldn't it would be detrimental to them if they if they just acted upon you know their 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 base feelings so um I say feelings you know lack thereof I should say well they they do have personal feelings yeah but it but it's it's the ability to um externalize or or, or to you know uh, empathize with with others um but yeah I would but yeah, I mean, just because you're a psychopath it doesn't, uh, it sounds so funny saying it, but it doesn't, you know, necessarily, you know, mean that you would by, by, by default become violent. Sure, you might be more no. prone to it, but, you know, like, like Josh has highlighted, you know, it, it does have its, its advantages in terms of if you are trying to go up the career ladder, you could be certainly a hell of a lot more ruthless than somebody who is very very in touch with their emotions and, and empathetic towards others and you know w would worry about what others others think of them whereas you know if, if you if you lack that ability you can just shoot for the moon 
And I, I would also like to clarify that I think most psychopaths go through their life without being criminals. You know, it's only a select few that choose to be. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm being some sort of apologist for them. Um, Come on, I will tell you what, I, I want, I want to, I want to see a Lotus Eaters stream on the apology for psychopaths. I, I, I need, <laughs> we need in defence of psycho, psychopathy. I, I couldn't do it. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm too empathetic. I'm, I'm sure you could make the argument. I suppose you could argue that they they fulfil a certain social role that mm. people need to fulfil. There are jobs that they're. Like surgeons, for example, you could say, mm. well, it makes them better at being medical professionals. I definitely couldn't do that. No, I could I mean, never get over the, the notion of cutting into someone. I would feel too bad yeah, even if I were helping them. And, and not just that, but imagine having to tell somebody they've lost a loved one. Imagine having okay. to have that conversation. I do it, no. You know, mm. the, uh, you, the, the ability to separate yourself emotionally from from the job. I think you you, you actually said it earlier about when um, you spoke to like prison guards and they just have this ability to switch off. I mean that that ability in in that kind of role as well, you know, when, mm. especially when you deal with the kinds of um, situations that, that that they deal with. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, let's say that uh, you, I think you can kind of easily envisage cases where psychopaths would be incredibly helpful and beneficial. So, just as you can imagine cases where actually you you would need a high amount of empathy to succeed. Um, There'll be cases where too much empathy would be a problem. Yeah. So administering of justice uh, would be one. I think the surgeon example is a really good one, but maybe let's stick to administration of justice. You know, if someone's, gosh, let's say, um, or tell you what, a vet, you know, a, you know, don't know why this example comes to mind, but... Uh, Sometimes the kindest thing that a vet has to do isn't something that a, a pet's owner could do, but you need a vet to be able to be very rational and non-empathetic and removed from the situation uh, in order to make a rational, calm choice that is ultimately the best. Hmm. Um, I don't know why I went for that really weird example. Apologies. I'll give you a the... real-world example where they actually use psychological tests to vet out empathetic people. That oh, is... please. Oh, wow, um, okay charities um particularly charities where they send people to impoverished countries they, mm. they deliberately set out to find people because one of my friends applied and he was too empathetic basically he cared <laughs> wow. too much and mm. um yeah they're just like yeah you might not be suited it will break you emotionally and so we would rather colder people go mm. which is probably why uh, wherever the sort of un peacekeepers go in the third world um, a trail of atrocities follow Sorry, Oxfam, most Oxfam, I was going to say Oxfam. Yes. Oh, mate. <laughs> hey, look, don't have a go at them. They've got the Progress Pride flags in every single shop, so it can't be all bad. It's br you got to let them off a few of the yeah. misdeeds at least. Yeah. What's a, what's a bit of child I'm... abuse here and there? If you you know, if you can. Uh... They put the flag up. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. That's good for one at least. Anyway, we're getting into dangerous territory. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I had a minor point about some of the translations that didn't come through on subtitles. Um, like I, I'm dropping this way too late in the stream, but there's just an interesting one where um, the the translation most of you saw, I think, downplays the informality of the prisoners at the start. So one example is when they say they're asked, "Do you know what your role is?" and the subtitles say, oh, "Yeah, we're participants, research participants." And what they actually said was the equivalent. They said, uh, or we would say guinea pigs. So they're being quite self-deprecating and mm. droll, and then that drops out of everything they say later in the film. Uh, the guards also use increasingly militarized language as they go on. Uh, and you see that in the numbers. So early on, uh, 82 is Zweiuntaktik, um, and later, once they've started getting really brutal, they use the military too. They say Zweiuntaktik. So it's like a minor detail that you can't really convey in an English subtitle. Right. Also, when Beruz uh, was putting uh, the uh, female scientist Jutta in her place, um, he refers to her as Frau Doktor. Yeah. Which I think was being a little shady, like implying, oh, no, the worst thing is the misogyny, that he went out of his way to say Frau Doktor. 
and they didn't translate that because our word is just doctor and it's mm. just kind of shame that they dropped that out but mm. i did pick up on that actually um I mean, that's one of the few German words I actually understand. Um, what, doctor? No. <laughs> I think doctor's still the same. Isn't it? Just yeah. Um, arzt. Okay? Yeah. No, arzt would be uh, what we'd say, but they use it for the title is doctor. So. Doctor. Um, ah, okay. My, minor details that I picked up that I just thought people might be interested in, but um, I just, I looked at my notes and I thought, oh, nuts i forgot to mention that so um but with that all said i mean i for me i think that's everything unless there's anything else folks uh we can get out ahead of super nanny uh um, sorry josh deep law deep super nanny is the uh, being we must appease uh we cannot run over two and a half hours uh lest uh she smite the stream i realize some of the things sound very weird uh, <laughs> it's all right i mean i, I work on on an online yes. sort of commentary business. We have our turns of phrases as well. It's a sort of a, a cult-like language. That, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's very self-deprecating. We're not a, we're not a cult, by the way. No, no. Um, it, it's a... Wait, you're not? Oh, right. Well, I'm unsubbing. Damn it. It's it's a nice in-group identifier. You know, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're all used to it. And, um, uh, I, I, my, my deep hope is that the kind of YouTube censorship avoidance language becomes its own sort of unofficial slang like Polari or sort of gypsy speak or um, what would be in a, a bonics. It could be our robotics. How about that? Talking Pigeon. about Minecrafting someone. Pigeon. I do find it quite funny. It's, it's kind <laughs> of absurd language. And I, I'm quite a fan of absurdity more generally. And... <laughs> Like referring to being so euphemistic and using the term like mid century German never fails to make me laugh. So it's so oh. esoteric and beating around the bush. There's something funny about that mm. sort of impulse to be so indirect. I was in a Waterstones in the history department and I there was a couple next to me, like they looked early twenties, and just one of the chaps randomly referred to the mustache man. And I was like, oh, it's spreading. <laughs> It's spreading. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Well, I think that is probably everything, folks. Uh, it has been a good discussion. On, I think possibly too interesting because I think we almost skimped on the film because the topic was so interesting. <laughs> Bad luck, Das Experiment. Um, uh, so, folks, if you want to start getting your scores in, I see Mergut's already dropped the first score. Uh, we use, out of co of course, uh, actually uh, inspired by uh, Carl, we use the burgers system, so out of 12 burgers. Um, so if you want to start getting your scores in, folks, we will give our closing thoughts and scores now. And uh, TCG, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, OK. Um, I, I quite liked it. Uh, it was a bit a bit tricky to follow at, at some parts, but just because of the whole um, having to constantly read through subtitles, which normally isn't a problem for me because I watch everything with subtitles. But because I actually needed them, uh, as a, as opposed to like cursory glance, um, I, I did feel like I was my, my attention was being taken away a little bit from the film. But that's not the film's fault. That's just the fact that there, there wasn't a, a, an English dub. Um, but I mean, what I what I really like about it is the fact that it is quite um, that it is based on something that you can actually sort of point to uh, as as an actual experiment that, that that did take place, and and you know while it clearly exaggerated certain um, aspects of the Stanford experiment, I you know it's it's a film. It, it's not going to bother me in that regard. Um, that being said, there were you know as I say we've already mentioned it. You know the. the the very end where they sort of the, the prison guards do their uprising um didn't really seem consistent logically that they would then take in uh the the experimenters um as, as well whilst also trying to maintain the experiment from continuing so it, it kind of lost me a little bit there but i could i could see why they would do it you know to, to ramp up the tension and the and the, and the action and and, and and the thrilly and 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 the, and the thriller of it, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, what isn't there to like about this film? 
you know you get some decent little bits of violence um i thought some of the um the, the, the you know the makeup the visual effects were, were pretty good um Tvail Nukta getting uh, brained by that baton was quite sort of a horny bonk moment <laughs> um the like as with the fire extinguisher the um yeah catching the hand you know catching the knife in the hand and then sort of like having a that really got me man pulling it out um the way he struggled with that I, I really like that um oh yeah and also a journo got peed on so yeah uh it would be a 12 out of 12 for that but you know what sort of uh but now nah, I'd, I'd give it in in all seriousness i'd probably say it's like a solid eight eight and a half burgers um a little bit of ketchup uh, for the blood um definitely some battered uh meat you know with a baton and uh fire extinguisher um yeah yeah we'll go with that we'll go with that okay okay oh and and a, and a ping pong ball <laughs> just on the side just on the shot side. out shot out from between yeah. on the between top, the like an olive. <laughs> yeah, yes on the top like an olive yes <laughs> oh, <laughs> goodness. Oh, okay fair fair it seems to be pretty in line with the chat don't let chat influence you though uh josh how about yourself closing thoughts and scores on das experiment well i really quite enjoyed the film actually and um Although there were some things about the, the plot and some sort of believability problems that would prevent me from giving a really high score, I thought it, it set out to do something quite interesting. And I quite appreciated the fact that it surprised me in some ways that weren't just artificial and cheesy and that it tried to do something interesting and it, I suppose it achieved it to some extent. Um, but I, I would say, I know, I know it seems to be the sort of median score, but maybe a, an eight out of 12. I mean, I'm quite a harsh critic anyway. So that's still quite high by my standards. But at the same time, I think it was the kind of film I needed to watch as well. I've seen a lot of things that have been very different from this, and it was a good change of pace from what I'd been watching. So that might well bump up the score i would might be inclined to a seven out of 12 but i think eight out of 12 overall is there, is there a single change you could make that would bump it up a couple of a couple of burgers um make Tarek less annoying would make me empathize with him more and care more about what happens to him because i, I kind of got to the point midway through the film where i'm just like well you kind of did invite this on yourself to a certain extent. Didn't you? you you knew that things were escalating. You're, you're meant to have some sort of understanding of sociology in the, the background of your character. Mm. So you'd think you would have a pretty good understanding of social dynamics, but apparently not. Maybe he was taught by a, a bunch of Marxist sociologists, which is increasingly the case. In Germany, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, fair play, fair play. I did constantly struggle with the idea that this was a, a world in which the Stanford experiment hadn't happened. It's like, I, I just mm. thought, wouldn't you naturally reference it? Like, it's just a, it was a, a, a minor wrinkle for me that just... I did um, rationalise that by saying that um, some experiments recruit their participants based on ignorance of the methodology. Mm. So they say, have you participated or have any knowledge of an experiment like this before? And that helps filter out certain people who might mm. ruin the experiment fair play fair play okay so uh, we're lots of clustering around here which seems fair um for myself uh i'm not going to differ too much to be honest maybe i'm just uh too high in agreeableness who knows but um i find myself clustering to an eight as well the kind of score you go for that it's you know it's well over the halfway mark it's not a do not watch this it's a there's something to say about this there's something interesting there's a decent bit of subtext in it it'll get your brain working but it's far from perfect it's got flaws um for me i i could bump it up a lot by having Tarek not be the instigator or instigate but have it be to his trauma not because he's a pain in the bum journalist 
Um, I would very happily remove Dora entirely and get your symbolism elsewhere and thereby shave about 15 minutes off the movie. It is a tiny bit long. Um, and I think the music could have been stronger for keeping a consistent atmosphere of escalating tension. But, um, you know, those are that's a lot of criticisms, but they're not horrific flaws. Uh, there's very creative uh, photography in this that I quite liked. The lighting was striking. Um, it was very well designed. So even just changing the lighting made its very limited set uh, much more visually interesting. So that is a, a big positive. Um, so an, an eight out of 12 might seem, you know, quite unimpressed, but it's well over the halfway mark. It's just, it, it's not landing into the zone of being a favorite or being something I would say you should rush out to watch. Um, I'd say if you were interested in something like this that hit a little harder. Oh, we've got a Dora Delender est. I can't, I, yeah. You, you've got to cut things down, you know. The unnecessary European art film vibe did not help. Um, if you want something like this that hits a bit harder, strong recommendation for the Belko experiment, um, which... Uh, I'll just say it's similar to this. And you get John C. McGinley, a.k.a. Dr. Cox from Scrubs in it. Him in a horror film. It's good fun. Uh, so, yeah, mm. I, about an eight as well, to be honest. Um, so, you know, it's a well done burger. It's a nice bit of ketchup, but not too much. But the sauerkraut on it, weird tinge. And it's just a little too big. So that is, yeah. I'd, I think uh, that is everything. So, you know, this point of the stream, what we do, we give out the horror homework, the horror homework you've been told uh, a couple of times, but we'll just put it out there once more. It is Kill List from 2011. Uh, we have actually, uh, next week, Next week, uh, Harry's coming on, actually, Josh, yeah, he, he, said, he said, please, can we do Kill List? I was like, yeah, that's psychological. We'll get that in, sure. He has already told me about that, actually. I'm chuffed to rewatch it. It it made quite the impression the first time, and I think it'll be very good on the rewatch. It's it's one I suspect it has a lot hidden in. So get I've your never seen it. Ooh, well, give it a go, give it a go, and uh, you know, be in the chat next week. Ah, oh, no, we have triggered Super Nanny. Gosh darn it, we crossed over. Never mind. Okay, so <laughs> Kill List by Ben Wheatley, 2011. Give it a watch. It's got a. Uh, it's got a lot in it that I think you will all like. It's quite intense and disturbing. I think it'll, it's quite a contrast from this. I think we'll go from it. Uh, before we leave, though, of course, uh, let, uh, we'll just do some shills if anyone wants it. So, uh, TCG, any shills from you? Um, at the moment, uh, I... I, I've been I've been on holiday recently with the family, so I've I've not I've not been near a computer to to uh, research or anything like that. But while I was away, okay, I I was watching Challenge TV with my daughter, and uh, we were watching Bullseye, and my wife reminded me of a of a of a, of a, of a very specific uh, true crime case that involves a game show. Now. If you're American or someone from, you know, the North North American sort of side of the world, you might immediately cast your mind to uh, Rodney Alcala, Al Al um, who appeared on a game show over, uh, I think it was in the 70s, and um, it later transpired that he was perhaps one of America's most prolific serial killers. Well, mm -hmm. I can tell you, it's not that case. We have our own homegrown one here. Uh, I'm currently in the process of researching and, and, and scripting on that one at the moment, so I will get that one out as soon as humanly possible. Work has been absolutely manic as per usual. I already did a 12-hour shift yesterday after coming back, um, so I needed another day off. Um, but we are fast approaching 9,500 subscribers, so we're just over 500 away from 10,000, okay? If we get to 9,500 before the end of the month... I will I will bring back a freaking Florida Man Friday stream. Nice. Or actually it would be it would be <laughs> it would be the I can't remember what the game I can't remember what the name of the show was. I think it was Freaking Florida. Bring Florida back Golden Balls. Yeah, oh, no, I ain't bringing that back. No way. 
<laughs> Members can still watch that train wreck. <laughs> uh, but I, I might, I, I'll bring back a freaking Florida Man Friday to celebrate. Nice. We'll, we'll look up some fresh Florida Man articles. I love it. I love and it. I, that I should hope, be motivation. I, 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 I hope you'll be there as well. Naturally, naturally. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Ah, oh, lovely. Uh, Josh, obviously, people know where to find you. What contemplations should they watch when they sign up to Lotus Eaters? Well, um, obviously all of them, but I, I don't know. It, I've got one on everything that you could possibly be interested in. I've, I've pretty much covered all of human history now. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm joking, of course. But no, I, I would say choose the one that you find the most interesting. I've got almost 140 now, so there's going to be something. And um, I, I try and apply my academic background to try and dig a bit deeper into stuff doing a mini series on cults at the minute um if that interests you um i covered the cargo cults of melanesia which is already out there's going to be another one coming out this weekend looking at the osho movement who was an indian mystic um, famous for one of his followers carrying out the largest bioterror attack in u.s history in 1985 i think or 84 trying to influence an election um I probably shouldn't have framed it in that way because YouTube might be mad. Um, sorry. Fortified. What what Josh meant to say was fortify an election. For, yeah, the, the number's four to five. Yes. Um, yes. But um, yeah, I suppose that's that's where to look. Also, I'm, I'm, I produce weekend segments, news segments on our YouTube channel. If you don't want to leave YouTube, that's where you'll find me and you'll hear me talking about politics. Um, so that might not be your cup of tea, but... Maybe worth checking out. Oh, lovely. Well, heartily recommended uh, by me. So there you go. Do that. You, and, uh, you know where to find people. And uh, yeah. All right. Well, thanks ever so much, Josh, for coming thank on. Thank you very much for having me. That's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I really enjoyed this. We too interesting. We went over Super Nanny's <laughs> limit. <laughs> so and uh, also TCG. Good to have you back, man. Yeah, no, great to be back. Thank you for having me on. And uh, yeah, sorry I've missed the last few weeks. It's been a uh, just manic and and uh, yeah, but no, great to be back on. All right, and uh, chat that that is all for this week. You have your horror homework. It is kill list. We will be back next week. Uh, there is going to be a poll for the uh, final film in this arc. There is also probably going to be a poll for the end of the month fun stream. I've got a couple of ideas and we'll see what you go for. Uh, but with that, seeing as we are overrunning, I will leave you now with the usual sign off. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, y'all. Cheers. Hashtag shield gang. <laughs>